recording now. Oh, thank you very much uh, to everybody for coming. We've got good numbers today. I was getting a little worried that numbers were sinking a little bit. Uh, this is an extremely, at least in my opinion, an extremely interesting and very contemporary subject, the subject of archaeofuturism. I think the term was first coined by Guillaume Fay, who I knew when I was in Paris. Um, he was probably one of the best public speakers, if not the best public speaker I've ever personally experienced. The only possible exception or, or competitor it would be George Galloway. Um, I would put those two as some of the most inspiring public speakers independently of what one thought of their views. Um, I'm not going to spend a, a, a long time uh, introducing Guillaume Fay, except to say that he was a prominent member of GRESS, the French so-called New Right, and left in, sl in slightly under a cloud because there were differences of opinion essentially between whether one should continue entirely theoretically in one's views, which was the view and still is of Alain de Benoit and others, or whether one should in some way be engaged in the material world in some way politically active in whatever form that might take, which was much more Guillaume Fay's point of view. Um, and on that note, I should like to hand over to Edith, who's going to introduce or give us an hors d'oeuvre to archeo or archeofuturism. Uh, Edith, shall I um, share on the screen the piece entitled Post Apathy? Yes, I think it would be easier if people could read it at the same time um, as okay. listening to it. Okay. Uh... Can, you, uh, can, can, can everyone see that? I can see it. Edith, can you see that? No, but I, I've got a printer. Ah, oh, OK. Yes, I can. Yeah. Right. After you. Uh, uh... OK, well, I mean, I don't know anything about archaeofuturism. This is a personal quest for me to see what comes up. Um, I did find this excellent. Well, I think it's an excellent definition of it by someone called Ahmed al Dahil, who lives in America, but is obviously of uh, Arab origin. Um, uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. He's a, a convert to Islam. Oh, really? I read that he was living in the UK and I've tried to contact uh, uh, white Muslim ah. friends to ask who he is, but uh, I haven't found out. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, anyway, he didn't really, he only gives his name as Ahmed on his uh, website. So I thought I'd just uh, read through it because um, uh, I don't have any ideas myself. Um, so um, I'm starting now in a book published at the turn of the millennium, which is called Archaeofuturism, European Visions of a Post-Catastrophic Age. Phi provided an interesting attempt at building a new meta-political theory called Archaeofuturism, constructed out of two terms, archaism and futurism. Phi sought to redefine archaism by arguing that it should be given its true meaning in Greek, derived from the Greek noun arche as a foundation, beginning or founding impulse. There are parallels between Faye's concept of arche and the concept of the central domain, a term which Carl Schmitt succinctly defines as, and this is a quotation from Schmitt, the problems of other domains are solved in terms of the central domain. They are considered secondary problems whose solution follows as a matter of course only if the problems of the central domain are solved. And, and I thought that fitted in actually with something Stead showed us um, with hexagons, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> the central domain of any civilization is a moral foundation that would inform secondary problems such as the political, legal, economic, cultural, and other phenomena to be found in society. Being the moral foundation of a civilization, the archi can be seen as the engine which drives the people forward and once abandoned leads them to surf on the exhausted fumes of that moral inheritance until they unceremoniously vanish from history. To Phi, egalitarian modernity was the key obstacle to maintaining Europe's central archi 
and freeing Europe from the grip of cosmopolitanism, progressivism, and any other perceived enemy, owing to egalitarian modernity's rejection of any stable core. It's also sometimes called liquid modernity, by the way. Though stable, the core arche had to be alive and capable of reacting. An arche is never inanimate, never without a soul. Thus, an important element of the arche is its vitalism, an organic and non-mechanistic mentality, respect for life, self-discipline based on autonomous ethics, humanity, and an engagement with bio-anthropological problems. Its place in archaeofuturism was to combine a healthy respect for human tradition and social organizations with a deference to nature in its wonders, constraints and realities. For Phi, no future vision was possible if the biological laws of civilization were disrespected. As such, transhumanist projects were doomed to fail in creating the future by rejecting which is doomed to fail in creating the future by rejecting the essential aspects of life. Five theorized that futurism alone was not an antidote and criticized the technological sciences where the futurist mentality may prove suicidal owing to the deifying of technology as something that can solve anything. This deification is today commonly found among the technologists in Silicon Valley and other places who place an overriding trust in the ability to use software to solve pretty much any issue in human nature and society. By abandoning the biological reality of human and earthly organisms, technologists risk catastrophic meddling in processes they refuse to understand. And only an arcade could provide the sort of living but firm moral base or anchor to prevent this. Archaeofuturism was to be the dialectical overcoming of the gulf between tradition and technology to create a philosophical alliance between the Apollonian sovereign and rational will to shape the world, which I must say as a woman, I, of course, I respect enormously because I don't have it, uh, and the Dionysian's aesthetic and romantic mobilization of pure energy. I don't think I have that either, but anyway, for Phi attempting to build a vision of the future without thinking about its archi was akin to building a house on quicksand. Naturally, archaeofuturism rejected the theory of moral progress, believing that the worldview of a people must rest on unchangeable bases, even as forms as, and expressions may vary. Progress must be replaced with movement. Movement meant that the arche was not to be rigidly inflexible, but able to shift slightly to accommodate futurism without losing its foundational nature. Phi makes an important point about progress as opposed to movement and flirts with something we may all feel today as we experience social and technological decline, the rhetoric around progress is reaching fever pitch. However, it is likely that this is willful self-delusion in the face of the increasingly widening chasm before us. We are suspended in time, destroying the past, which inhibits our ability to construct the future. And so we experience progress without movement. We are now living in tumultuous times where the moral base of society has been firmly hollowed out and technological advancement is slowing. The reconnection of archaic values with the false Faustian or Promethean or Apollonian spirit is, at least in Phi's estimation, the catalyst for any future renaissance. Thank you very much. I, I think the next thing up is the very short uh, uh, description of, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll read this if I may. Archaeal futurism is both archaic and futuristic, for it validates the primordiality of Homer's epic values in the same breath that it advances the most daring contemporary science, Michael O'Meara. Michael, I think. Mark. Yeah, this is the forward to a series of novels. The background to this is that uh, uh, Guillaume Fay wrote a, a, a novel and a political statement 
called Archaeofuturism. I can't remember the date. I think that was in the late 80s or early 90s. And then he, uh, there was a second edition, I suppose it was anyway, um, which contained a number of short stories. Anyway, here's his forward. In my book essay, Archaeofuturism, which was published, oh, there we have it, in 1999 <laughs> and translated into Italian and English, I sought to demonstrate two points that although modernity has, for the moment, eliminated our ancient values, these values will return with a vengeance. And in the future, they are likely to dominate once again, as will the stakes of the game and our modes of thought. Second, chances are good that the current globalized civilization will not survive the 21st century, thanks to what I named the convergence of catastrophes that is likely to arrive in the near future. A new middle age knocks at the door. We are on the eve of a major rupture in the history of humanity, and surely it will be the most massive ever. At the end of the Archaeofuturism essay, I wrote a short story, a tale in the fantastic vein. You'll find it in the appendix, though it isn't linked to the present work. And my editor asked me to write additional narratives in the same style. So I did. The result was 11 short stories, all strung together by a narrative logic. You could read each episode independently of the others, but I advise you nonetheless begin at the beginning in 1914 and finish at the end, several millennia hence. Set forth and discover your possible future and that of your descendants. Happy reading. Thanks very much. Uh, my, might I suggest that those people who have to leave and would like to could possibly be, be the, the uh, people who read okay. first. Um, let's go to the... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, can, can, can we all see the, the first page? Can. It could be a bit more to the left if that's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't. It, it, it's it's a double page uh, uh, yeah. spread. You see, I'm I think sure, that's... I'm sure people will be okay with that. Yeah. Uh, no, because um, the end of the, the, the words on the right hand side are cut off, so you can't read it out. You 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 can't you can. see it. Um, well, I can see it. Yeah, it um, may be um, Frank if you cut off the the people. Now, yeah, oh, I, now I can't. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's still on the right. It still cuts off some of the words. I think maybe that's a um, maybe an issue. I don't know in in, in it's being transferred to to, to your to you, uh, well, Father Frank. Mean, that, that, so that, let that, let's that's we really because I can't. no. Let let us have uh, Stefan. Did you uh, say? No, you... Wait a minute. Maybe because it's partly covered by the. Um... Yeah, yeah, cut off the faces. You just put yes, a, a, a cross on. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's and uh, cut off participants. Mm -hmm. You can you can just move that to one side if if you sort of uh, touch it. Uh, and, and well, maybe. I can't do it. Uh, wait a minute. Let's see if I can cut off participants. Um, boy, I I can I can just I mean, put a mouse on work. And shift it. Sh uh, um, Stefan, can you can you see it? Okay. Stefan, are you are you there? Yes, uh, but I am about to leave. Ah, oh, okay. All yeah. right then. Uh, yeah. Don't don't worry. Um, is there anyone else who? Um, I, I can read. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, all right, I don't have the very. I just have June nineteen fourteen. All right. Oh, right. so yeah, uh, so yeah, that's it. Right. Europe is at the height of her power, and summer enters proudly, ready to shine with all her fire. It's the final summer of the Belle Epoque, the last beautiful days before the Iron Hurricane. And although international tensions continually unnerve the public mind, in high society, everyone is serene. This crisis will surely blow over like the rest, like the one in 1910, won't it? And Kaiser will never go to war. He's not mad. R R Rummold and his young friends were preparing to spend the summer in Biarritz, the most stylish spot at the moment. They would all set out the following week on the new and exceptionally comfortable overnight express, the Blue Arrow, which links Paris to the luxurious Basque Resort at an average of over 80 kilometers per hour. 
a progeny of Pagret, while waiting to leave to pass the time, they had invited a very reputable and expensive clairvoyant to take tea with them. The toast of all Paris, Mademoiselle Delphinia Pythia, Greek by birth, was a pleasingly plump 50-year-old who dulled herself up like a call girl. Her success came thanks to the disturbing accuracy of her predictions, but also because, contrary to her competitors, she didn't modulate the proportion of good news to match the amount of money on the table. Her notoriety began when, in February of 1912, she notified a rich American heiress who was passing through Paris that her husband was about to die, about to die on the way home from Cherbourg to New York in a shipwreck, which in fact occurred. Abraham Gould, the ironworks king of Pittsburgh, died in the wreck of the Titanic. His young wife, Janet, had survived. Scooped up by the Carpathia, everyone in Paris knew the story. So Romuald and a few other young men had decided to invite her, not so she could tell them their individual fortunes, but to get her to play a little fortune-telling game with the future of France, of Europe, of the world, of humanity. They wanted to dissuade the ridiculous fussing of certain of his young friends who were frightened by the idea of a possible war. Mademoiselle Pythia, no one believed that was really her name, had accepted in consideration of the attractive sum they proposed, 500 gold francs. At the tail end of the Belle Epoque, despite the reigning ideology of science, the upper crust loved clairvoyance, making tables turn to talk to the dead, visiting haunted houses, taking photos of ghosts, etc. They were seated on the sunny terrace of a pleasant cafe in the charming town of Olney sur Bois, northeast of Paris, where Ramoud had a pretty estate he'd inherited from his father, a prosperous dealer in imported wood from the forest of Canada. In that place and time, the pleasures of life still meant something. The wealthy bourgeois and modest workers lived together in harmony. Downtown, the golden youth of, of the nobility and the upper bourgeoisie swam in the insouciance and certainty that had that opened a century of infinite peace and progress, as Victor Hugo had predicted in his poem, The 20th Century, at the end of the legend of the ages. Uh, for, for Father Frank, can you can you see it? What? Do you want well, to... no, I'm afraid uh, I I can read uh, the first two lines on the left, but I can't read the rest. I'm I can to... I can move it down. I, I yeah, I'll move it down. All right, uh, let, let, let's try and do. Um, yeah, uh, uh, because I got the participants um, blocking my view, some of my view. I'm trying um... to see. Well, can I, can I, do... can I just suggest, Father Frank, that of course, oh. the top of where your participants are. You've got like three icons. There's a, a one that looks like a dash, and then there's a block, and then can you see those at the top? Of where the, the top. Oh, at, across the top of where the participants are. Can you see that? Uh, yes. If you press the one to the one on the left, that just looks like a dash. That should reduce the participants. It, it says, oh, wait a minute. Now, well, I'm ah, wait a minute. No, I will see. Ah, hold on. On the, the dash. It says here, choose virtual background, mute my audio, no pin. No, it's no good. I think you've got the wrong thing there. Uh, yeah, the, 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 um, if, if you can see a, a strip of, of faces, uh, oh. at the top, as, as Linda said, that, that, you know, that there should be uh, four options, a, a dash, a square, two squares, and, and a kind of... Uh, yeah, I can uh, see a dash. I can it, see it, a dash. If, if, if you select that, it, it, it should mean that everything ah, is... Ah, okay, done it. Miracle. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Miracle. Right. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, after, after Father Frank, uh, Linda, you could, you could take, take, take it up. Um, all right, so from uh, once, once they had taken their tea, Father Frank. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, the problem is uh, the left page is still a bit... Um, Still low. Uh, it's not the right page. Ah, yeah, you, okay. You, yeah, he, he can I move think it. I can get it somewhere it. here. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, well, I hope so. Anyway, uh, 
I'm trying to see if I can raise it up all the way, the right page, but I don't seem to be able to do that. No, no, you can't. I have to do that. I have to do that. Stead um, does that for you. Yeah. You well, okay. So here we go. Once they had taken the tea and the coffee was drunk and the moustache and waiter was serving up sand to a young gentleman who took the opportunity to cut and light their cigars and a finger of port to the young ladies, Romuald asked the psychic his first question. How do you see the future, my dear? What do you think of his rumors of war with Germany? Her answer was abrupt and cast a pall. At the end of the summer, a war will erupt, a war of violence that's never been seen before. And this war, which will last more than four years, will be the beginning of the end, not just of Europe, but of the entire civilization in which we live. Why do you say that, giggled the young and pretty Vice Countess of Albury? Because, Clairvoyant responded suddenly, the war in which Germany will be defeated will have a chain of consequences which will resound throughout the 20th century. And at the end of this chain, there will be a great catastrophe. The girl, stupefied, lowered her eyes. Delfina added irritably to Romuald, uh, the rules of the game you propose to me don't involve answering vague questions. My gift only works on very precise and particular questions, connected to the place where I happen to be and the things I have in front of me. You want me to go on? Um, uh, it, it's up to Linda. Do if, if you want to, for, for the fact, to go on? Yeah, carry on. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up later. Yeah. Well, I don't mind you taking over, but if you ask me, okay, I'll carry on. Yeah. So the young heir smoothed her sick cravat and asked his first question. In, let us say, three years to the day, in June of 1917, what will this nice, shady little public square where we sit be like? The Fina concentrated, closed her eyes, and then Miss Cafe shuttered. There are no more customers. In the square, nurses and nuns pulled the gravely wounded, lined up or stretcher on stretchers for a motorized trunk. They moaned, they moved them towards the street over there. Yes, Wall remarked absently. 200 meters from here, there is a Catholic hospice. Twisting his moustache for a pretentious young Marquis of saint fort best known for burning his family fortune among the Champs Elysees gambling set, decided to speak. He was a nationalist and very anti German, a monarchist, a member of a burgeoning Action Francaise. He had recently exiled, excited, his three year military service with the title of a, a lieutenant of the 33rd Regiment of Infantry of the Line. Uh, I think I could you tell he's American. I should have said left hand perhaps. Mm, a great American. seducer. He was trying to impress the lovely Jean de Bré seated next to him. Dear Mademoiselle Pithier, do you see the coat of arms on my signal ring? He showed it to her. Two lions rampant on a field of blue. Where will it be, for example, 10 years from now to the day in June 1924? By then I'll be 34 years old. And as I hope, I'll be a husband and a father, he said, as his hand brushed Jean, Jean, Jean's or Jenny's. Yes. Clairvoyant emptied his port wine, stirred up a ring, touched it and rubbed the young man's finger and closed her eyes. Silence. Then she answered. A date indicated this lovely piece of jewelry will repose two meters below the earth, give or take, to a circle of finger bone. Ah, oh, where? The young Marquis had gone pale. Let me see, in eastern France, in an old wood ravaged by artillery where nothing grows, northeast of little town of Verdun. The strange prediction cast a chill over the group. Romuald began talking again to cap attention. He laughed and ordered a second round of absent. All right. So in 15 years, in 1930, what would become of this charming little square <laughs> and his cafe? 
it will have reopened, I hope. Yes. If we be a dance hall, the people there look happy, they're dancing. Life seems to have got the upper hand. The clothing has greatly changed. Automobiles, much more modern than those we have now, are parked across the square. All is once, all is well once more, but only on the surface. The fire is not quenched. It smolders. Albert Hautfield, a young, a brilliant student of the Ecole Polytechnique, a lover of automobiles and the nascent field of aviation, murmured with a smile as he proposed a toast. Well, I feel better. So progress will be saved. Let's, let's drink to it. Then he added, let's continue our little game, dear madam. Let's jump 10 years. In June 1940, how does this square appear? Are the automobiles even better? Delfina focused, closed her eyes, and then whispered, it's an exodus. Excuse me. Yes, terrified bourgeois families are cramming luggage into huge automobiles, which start up and flee towards the south. A car filled with peasants, pulled by mules and stacked with mattresses and suitcases, crosses the square. A man cries, let's hurry, the German panzers will be here tomorrow. In a mocking tone, Miss Bosnesk de Brut, who took dance and voice lessons in hopes of making a career in a cabaret or of the opera, she didn't know which yet, her morals were dubious, <laughs> remarked, you and your Germans again. But I thought they lost the war. They come back. Is that what you mean? Indeed, the inferno rekindled. The end has not come yet, but it's approaching. How droll. By then I'll be 46, uh, 46 years old. I'll be at the height of my career. I hope the Prussian soldiers will come to see my show. The entire table began to laugh, except Romuald, who asked for the fortune, yeah, who asked the fortune teller a next question. I think I won't pass it on someone else. Huh? Uh, Linda, please, yeah. Uh, uh. Let's project ourselves further into the future, dear Delphinia, D Delphina. In 50 years, in June 1964, describe this public square for us. I'll let you can concentrate while I order you another glass of port. She closed her eyes and at the end of a silent minute said, the cafe where we sit has disappeared. The houses across the plaza, and what? she pointed. I'm just, just, oh, we're gonna go soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Oh. <laughs> No, Sorry, no, no. I can hear someone talking in the background. Yeah, there's Sorry. a bit of it, yeah. You need to turn off the put everybody on stum, probably. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, please, please continue. Um, okay, she pointed to some pretty bourgeois homes with gardens are being demolished. This is an immense construction site. Huge machines, cranes, and hundreds of workers are constructing gigantic buildings like cubes pierced with thousands of windows. One of them is 17 stories tall. And like in New York, interrupted Albert Hautfeuille. But I thought that as you predicted earlier, our civilization was going to crumble, that a catastrophe was coming. What you've described instead is progress. Only Subois will turn into New York. Madame Pithia cackled and locked eyes with him. Patience, my young friend. Fat lot of good it's done you to go to the fancy military academy. They never told you how human societies and civilizations resemble human bodies. At the beginning, an illness and its microbes trigger crises that are, un are surmountable, and the growth of the organism continues. But after a while, there comes a breaking point, and then come collapse and death. It will be the same for the Europe of today. The evil is already present, but it will take time to act. And the people of today don't understand that, nor will the men of the future, who, with a few exceptions, won't really understand what's happening before their eyes. They won't understand until it's too late. The countdown has already begun. This remark hit home with Wormwood, who was as attached to the family line he was preparing to find as he was concerned for the future of France and of that formidable civilization of progress and comfort, 
which his young generation was watching emerge. Without really believing her words, he was still struck by the innate conviction she radiated. And hadn't she predicted, for example, on top of the wreck of the Titanic in 1912, just last year in 1913, the assassination of the Grand Vizier of Istanbul in June, and the recovery of the Mona Lisa, which had been stolen two years before in Florence. Let's continue our game and advance in time. How do you see this spot state at the beginning of the 21st century in exactly a hundred years on the 21st of June, 2014? Everyone got the odd impression that her green eyes were swiveling in their sockets. She took a great deep breath drained her glass of port and let it rip in a strange voice, speaking slowly. The place where we're sitting has completely changed in atmosphere. Where this cafe was, there's a mosque that's filling with worshippers, all of them Arab, as far as I can see. Omaré de Sangfort, rolling his eyes, chuckled, a mosque? Why not a Hindu temple? The steeple of the little church that you see towering above the rooftops is no longer visible. Perhaps it has disappeared, though it could just be well hidden by the long avenue flanked with very tall buildings that all look alike, like giant boxes, rectilinear. At the feet of these buildings, there are children, adolescents and young men, strangely dressed, who are either lying about or are bickering. Most of them have black skin. The sidewalks of this wide avenue are lined with automobiles of rounded contours, um, Im immobile. There are women walking about, surrounded by dark-skinned children. All of them have their heads veiled, and some even have their faces covered with black cloth. Across from where we're sitting, around 200 meters away, I see a long, low building, which a mosque, dark skin and veiled women. But you're describing the colonies, my dear, interrupted Gontran Misra Belcour, a young man from a wealthy family who was at the colonial school studying for a brilliant career as administrator in French Africa. Your vision is fading. We're sitting here in France and you're giving us a description of Timbuktu. Not to mention, Albert added, that in my opinion, in a hundred years, the way things are going, science and progress will have made all religious superstitions disappear. So it's a bit uh, skewed. Shut her up, oh, shut up, shut up. Let her talk, Romuald snapped. Go on, mademoiselle. Delfina took a deep breath and sounding exhausted by her effort continued. So about 200 meters from here on the right, I saw a large, long building that bore in red this description. Supermarket, ouch, half of it was charred. It had been the victim of a fire and probably looting. And in the sky, I saw curious black objects flying over the town with a great roar. A sort of wheel on top of it was whirling at top speed. I heard another noise in the distance, like the squeal of relentless sirens. Now my vision has ended. All of this drains me. Try one more time, Pomoal begged. I still have one more question to ask you and I'll give you a bonus of 100 gold francs. Does somebody else want to carry on? Uh, uh, Adam, are you, are you still on the call? Yeah, hello there, Stead. Um, yeah. I, some, I would, due to my dyslexia, I would rather not. Is that okay? I'm yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course, of course. Buy. Yeah, don't worry. Um, um, my dribble. <laughs> Um, Mick, Mick, are you, are you, are you there? Yes, mate. Yeah. 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 Do, do you want to take, yeah, take up the, the yeah, do you yeah, want to okay. take up the baton for a bit? Thanks. Right. Okay. The young assembly felt uneasy. The psychic's last few answers didn't correspond to all their mental schemas. No one ordered more drinks. So, I your question, young man. It's simple and it will be the last, mademoiselle. Send yourself forward in a hundred years, so two centuries from now, to the 21st of June, 2114. 20, Describe for us this tranquil, tranquil place where we sit. The sea aside, 
then got up and took a few steps towards the centre of the plaza. The waiters, taken aback, watched her do a routine, her hands open before her, eyes closed. Then she sat back down. A troubling smile darkened her powdered face. Oh, this spot is tranquil, all right. There's a beautiful June solstice sun. Birds sing in the trees just like today. But the trees are no longer trim like the ones around this square. They seem wild and the ground is covered by brush and tall ferns and brambles. Those big buildings that were erected here a century ago are immense ruins covered with vegetation rising from the forest. Quiet, prey to a vague fear. She's delirious, who quietly replied. That Lily Ramol just gave her another hundred gold francs, so she's telling him a tale that can't be disproven to make him dream or frighten him. So he'll go to phony revelations. Asked Ramol, wait a second, yes, about a hundred. Clearing, dotted with little huts made of branches and bits of scrap iron. A few people, adults and children, are clumped around the fire, some of them squatting. It looks like they're cooking an animal, they caught. Their voices are raised, and it seems they're arguing. But how are they dressed? What do they look like? asked the young Viscountess of Albre, whipping the heavy air with a Chinese print fan. They're almost naked, some wearing hides and animal skins. The men have paint on their faces and torsos. All of them are very dark skin. They're black? Yes, Mademoiselle Vicomtesse, they're black. But, but the warm sun of this late midday in June dispersed all these Ill, Ill augering predictions. The young men were unaware that they were living their last happy days. The next evening at 10 o'clock on platform number five at the Gare de Lyon, the little group, after having dined at Train Bleu, the richly decorated new gastro pub that overlooked the platforms embarked upon the Blue Arrow. The young men gossiped and laughed while the porters stored their trunks in the quilted compartments, one for each traveller. The young ladies, of course, settled themselves in a different sleeper coach from that of the gentlemen. Before going to bed, Ramon and Albert went to have a cognac and smoke a cigar at the bar in the restaurant car. As they passed the poorly a little, little town in, in Tom, the locomotive howled out a long sinister trumpet blast. Do you really believe everything that crazy old bat said, asked Albert. About the far future, I don't know, but that vision of a horrible war with Germany frightens me. But there won't be any war. The Kaiser won't take the risk of going against the Triple on Tom, the United Kingdom, the Russian Empire and us. What troubles me is the nationalist fury in Europe. I get the feeling in this summer of 1914 that we're living out the, la at the last days of happiness. In his bunk, Rommel couldn't get to sleep. He kept remembering the seer's last words. Don't forget, don't forget. Everything will begin in a bit more than a month. At the beginning of August of this accursed year, it was an enchantment. The month of July 1914 would remain in their memories like the... Yes. the sweet fragrance of the last days of the bus of the very aptly named Bramolan at the end of his evening roulette that the Austro-Hungarian heir Franz Ferdinand had been assassinated by a Serbian nationalist he was the only one who was troubled by it but on the morning of 29th of July the golden youths all set on the Surrey terrace of the Mir Miramar Palace presiding over the powerful waves of the sea, found a headline that stretched across five columns of real Hungary has descended. They looked at each other in fear. Everyone knew about the Franco-Serbian pact. Could the fortune teller have been right? From that day on, the enchantment of the trip was broken and it began to rain. It was the 1st of August in the evening that everything was appended and in Ramon's mind, the old world collapsed. Everyone arose except for, um, oh, sorry. I think you'll have to, that, they were eating dinner in the elegant restaurant Cafe Music Club yeah. that was the height of fashion and price in Biarritz, Lochon. A man entered breathlessly into the dining room and shouted, 
Germany's just declared there was a dead, deathly silence. The racket only got once. And then suddenly the orchestra, which had been play, softly playing Offenbach melodies, broke into the first notes of the Russian imperial hymn. God save the Tsar by the <laughs> immediately to Marseille. Everyone arose except for everyone arose except for Rumor, who went pale and remained weakly in his chair. Amori de Saint-Fort was yelling his head off. Long live France, long live the Tsar. They had paid for the rooms till the 20th of August, but Germany declared war on the UK and France on August the 3rd. Everyone was ordered to mobilize. Their vacations were shattered. They made an urgent return to France. Sorry, they made an urgent return to Paris that very night in the Blue Arrow. In their bunks, the four boys knew that this was the last time they would sleep between sheets. The atmosphere was grim. Mm. Except for Amori, who kept repeating, we'll have a great laugh by all saints. This will be in Berlin, and on Christmas, you're all invited to my place for the Christmas Eve victory dinner. Save the date. Th thanks, Mick. Um, Vladimir, would, would you like to read for a little bit? Vladimir, are you... Are you um... Muted, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I would like, to, but the, the letters are too small. I can't see them even with my eye, uh, glasses, unfortunately. Okay, okay. I'll ask. I'll ask uh, someone else who's not uh, read. Um, Mehran, would, would 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 you like to read? Can you can you see it? Okay. Hello. Oh, uh, sorry. Um... I was uh, being engaged in something else, but uh, oh. but but uh, by the meantime, I'm enjoying your reading. Actually, good. Would you like to Would you like to continue from um, part part seven? Uh, the offensives had already begun. Uh, well, um, right now I'm not so that prepared, but I cannot see that uh, that text so well, actually. Uh, oh, okay. How to enlarge the full screen, maybe? Um, um, it's probably 125, should be okay. Yeah, okay, I'll... Uh, um, then, it, then it goes off. Yes, it goes off. Uh, well. Where are we now? Here, yeah, uh, seven. Seven. Okay, I, I, I can try my best, right? Yeah. So you can, uh, you know, um, stand out with my poor English, right? Okay, uh, the offensives had already begun. The Belgian army resisted heroically, heroically but was in general a uh, retreat. A uh, Janet de Albrey uh, preyed upon by the blackest Angus uh, got an uh, appointment with the clairvoyant in the, mount, in the month of September. She was received uh, in a, a sub, 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 sub yep. apartment in the Avenue Bousquet. Uh, you see that I was right, Mademoiselle. Uh, it's war indeed. What do you want to know? The price of the consultation was uh, 180 gold francs. Uh, um, on our last trip to uh, Biarritz, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not that familiar with this French. Uh, I'm Maury de Kinchport, and I decided to get married. But he was uh, mobilized with the 33rd Infantry, and for the month we were merely engaged. And you want to wait until the end of this war to get married and start a family? Yeah. You want to know whether uh, he survives? Yeah, she's breathed. When I think about your last uh, prediction uh, at uh, Olney Sous Bois, yeah. was that right? Yeah. Really okay. Right. Bois, yeah. The June, it troubles me. Uh, you said that in 1924, his ring was going to rest in the earth around the finger bone. I pray, I pray of you. Madame, 
uh, answer me. Uh, what do you see? Her voice and her hands trembled. Uh, she had lifted the netting on the front of the flowered hat, uncovering a thin young face, waxy, dis waxy despite the delicate pink uh, powdering of her cheeks. The seer uh, hesitated uh, to respond, feeling and pressing the girl's hand. Well, in any case, he will still be alive uh, the next the next time he will he, he has lived uh, the Lithuanian uh, Lit Lithuanian will uh, come back for a few days during the Christmas holiday won't he uh, on the uh, 23rd of December the girl knob uh, stunned that she knew uh, his rank and the date of his next leave so mademoiselle uh, take at one advantage of this short short time to get married but also to get a child in a pipeline. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty Jean uh, left uh, mortified by the uh, consultation. So, thanks very much, Mehran. Um, Travis, uh, could I call on you to uh, take the story forward? Hello, uh, Tra Travis. Can you can you hear me? Um, Dirk, Dirk, perhaps you you know if you can see it, uh, it's good to give everyone a a go. Would Would you like to continue? There's people on mute. I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, well, let, let's have a look. Is is uh, um, I don't think. Uh, no, uh, Tra Travis, uh, you're not on mute. So and uh, Dirk, uh, Dirk's sent a message in chat. No audio. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dirk's d d does seem to have a problem. Uh, in that case, M Michael, perhaps you could uh, Michael from Cologne. Perhaps you could uh, continue. Okay. The two young aristocrats married hastily the day after Christmas, 1914 and little Eleanor was born on the 26th of September, 1915, under the sign of Libra. Her father got the opportunity to see her and hold her the first time during an exceptional leave that was granted for this birth from the 5th of October to the 10th of October. And then the second and final time during his leave from the 4th to the 9th of April, 1916. Every day that passed, Jeanne thanked God that the police hadn't come to announce to her the death of Amori. Meanwhile, Amori, thanks to the general slaughter of officers, had been named captain, the commander of a company. The 33rd was rotated into the inferno at Verdun. On the 7th of May 1916, at nine in the morning, after an intense softening barrage of French 120 and 75 millimeter artillery fire, Captain Amaury de saint mars at the head of his fifth company, leapt from his trench and began the assault of the German positions near Douaumont. His men, all young peasants from the region of Léon in Brittany, didn't really understand Parisian French. Also serving under him was Senegalese auxiliary infantrymen who understood him just as badly. Their attack was broken by a barrage of 180 mm fire from the Fuss Artillery Regiment Nummer 2, also called the Royal Bavarians, positioned five kilometers away from them. At the moment when they arose, bayonets on barrels to attack the fort and retake it, the 5th Company on Hill 278 took head on a deafening salvo of shells loaded with picric acid. The young captain's body was instantaneously pulverized and his scattered and charred limbs were entombed like those of his men under several meters of earth that was thrown up by the impact of the projectile. In the explosion, only his officer's revolver thrown up in the air fell intact to the earth. A model 92 six shooter complete with its eight millimeter bullets in the barrel and engraved on the butt was his service number ADCF 33507. Jeanne d'Albray was raising Eleonora on her parents' property at Aulnay-sous-Bois, 
that peaceful and pleasant suburb north of Paris. The next leave that Damore was supposed to get would be in two months. She counted the days. On the morning of May the 13th, an awful premonition struck her when she heard what she had always feared, the strike of horseshoes that stopped at the threshold of the great house instead of trailing off in the distance. She ran to the window. Two police officers, one of which, the lower ranked, descended from his horse with a packet in hand. It had happened. The main job of the police between 1914 and 1918 was no longer arresting chicken thieves. Those had all either been mobilized or holed up where they came from, but to run all over France behind the lines, announcing to families the death of a son, of a brother, or of a husband, and to return the belongings of the deceased and their posthumous awards by order of the army. She didn't even have the strength to cry. The old policemen, the young ones were at the front, explained that the body of her spouse had been pulverized by a shell. He held out the regulation certificate, died for France, and then added, I am under orders to return to you his service revolver, which was found near the spot where his body was dismantled by enemy artillery fire. I have also been ordered to inform you that he did not die in vain, since in the course of his regiment's assault, the, the fort of Douaumont was retaken. He said goodbye and left. The fortune teller's predictions had come very precisely true. Oh, th thanks. Per 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 perhaps, uh, Edith, you, you could uh, take up the story. Um, well, has anybody else not read? Because I've already read. I know. I think I think we've had everyone, and I've uh, asked um, those. Yeah, I think everyone's been asked, okay. um, and some people haven't. Resp uh, uh, um, Travis hasn't responded. If you can hear me, Travis, then please please read. Otherwise, I think maybe we should start again. Yeah, he's speaking, but there's no sound. Oh, oh, really? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not seeing any image. Um... I, his mouth is moving, but there's no sound com coming. Oh, uh, it's just got to cross America. through his microphone. It just. Uh... Oh, um, Travis, you, you, uh, uh, if you can try and unmute yourself, otherwise we'll we'll. Um... He is unmuted. Oh, dear, oh sorry. That's strange, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. There's some audio issue. Um, Go, go to the um, microphone uh, icon and uh, do, do an audio test, which is by that. But in the meantime, Edith, please, please take up the baton. OK. Without knowing exactly why, Jeanne telephoned her that very night, her parents being amongst the few telephone customers in aulnay sous -Bois. An appointment was made the day after next for fortune telling. Dressed all in black, the young widow with her eyes all red wore only a single piece of jewellery a brooch at her breast. She had moved her wedding ring to her right hand as the old aristocracy traditionally does when we don't. As soon as the maid led her into the consultation room, Delphina understood and she saw something else. It's good that you came, Madame la Marquise. Without using my gift, I can see by your dress that the Marquis de Saint-Fort has died for France. Yes, and I've come to see you for a slightly odd consultation. The young vice counter, who was now a marquise, once title remained intact through widowhood, held back her tears and told the seer that she had followed her advice from 1914. She had married quickly and given birth to the little Eleanor, now eight months of age. She wanted to know what would become of this little orphan, to know her future. The seer responded indirectly, um, I suppose the officer reported the circumstances of the death of your husband. Can you tell me about it? Jeanne got the impression that the clairvoyant already knew everything. His body was pulverized by a German shell and his remains were buried by the earth. Just like you told him in your prediction in June 14, when you spoke of his ring being buried around a finger bone. How horrible. She couldn't hold back a violent sob. But the policeman also returned to me his service revolver, which had been found intact near the hole from the shell. Whatever you do, madame, guard that revolver dearly. There was a silence. 
Oh, but you're wearing a magnificent brooch. Unclasp it and show it to me. My vision is failing. It was a very precious jewel, very fashionable in high society, a round cameo, three centimetres in diameter, carved with a floral motif. The cover opened to reveal a watch whose mechanism was made entirely of gold, platinum and silver. It was worth 10,000 gold francs at the very minimum, made by Patek, a master clocksmith in Geneva. Since society women couldn't wear pocket watches or the new wrist watches, the Swiss watchmaker Aristide Patek had come up with this brooch for those ladies who wished to know the time. The seer examined it at length, felt it, and then closed her eyes. In thousands of years, this brooch with its little clock will have remained intact. And it will be examined by clever men on the other side of the Atlantic. In America, Pythia nodded, then returned to her main topic and pronounced her verdict. I assure you, your dear child, Eleanor, will have a happy and very peaceful life. And now I have to ask something very important of you. I'm listening. Keep that brooch absolutely safe, along with your late husband's revolver. It's ammunition above all. At the age of her majority, you will give them to Eleanor and you will order her an order under oath that she will leave them to her own descendants and to take infinite care of them. But whatever for? Do not seek to know, do as I tell you. Eleonore's own little children won't be dead yet when this world, this civilization has collapsed so that a new cycle may begin in the far future. Take my advice. The clairvoyant's voice was low. Her black eyes seemed to throw red sparks she refused the 180 gold francs for the consultation. Jeanne d'Albray, the widow of saint Four, returned after hailing one of the new motor taxis to the great family mansion of Dorney. She held Eleonore for a long time, then put her to bed near her dolls. And then she unpinned her beautiful brooch watch, went to find Amore's revolver and placed both objects in the safe. Night fell. By the bright, agreeable light of the electric lamp and shade, progress. She used her cartridge pen, progress again, to write out the instructions for Eleonore that she would read when she reached her majority. Uh, th 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 thank you. Uh, uh, Michael from Aldborough, are you or in Aldborough? Would you like uh, to continue? Uh, you just wrote he had to go. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, I have to go right now. Oh, thanks. Thanks for joining, oh, Michael. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, Father Frank, would you like to pick up the baton? Okay. Uh, pretty Jeanne aged very quickly. She remained a widow, rejecting her suitors. She let herself get her ugly, engulfing fat, preyed upon by permanent depression. The memory of her first kiss at Biarritz with Amaury uh, on the Plage de Basque during a stroll, a sunset came back to her incessantly. It haunted her dreams. The 27th of June, 1914, it lasted an eternity. She was of a summit of happiness. The roaring twenties passed without her notice. She died prematurely in 1936, just as the Front Populaire were rising at the age of 42. She succumbed to a combination of anemia and general cancer far too complicated for the doctors of the era to treat. Eleanor de Saint-Fort, her daughter at the age of 21, and before an adult, learned of the notaries of the contents of her mother's will. Her father's service revolver was given to her, along with the, oops, sorry, it's come up on my screen, I got to cut it off now, <laughs> along with the uh, brooch watch of her mother. She swore an oath to give them to the eldest of her children at her own death. The next year, 1937, she married a rich entrepreneur from Normandy, 15 years a senior, a crafty plebeian, but a good man, pioneer in the industrial manufacture of butter, Anatole Rictou. The couple made a home a con on Mount Saint-Michel, which had yet become an amusement park for tourists, they bought a beautiful granite vacation cottage and looked out over the bay at the foot of the abbey. 
may fix it up comfortably with the interior water closes a luxury at the time and uh, called it the blue bird. And at all gave Eleanor three sons, the eldest of which Jacques was born in 1938. After our widowhood, Mama Lena, as the many grandchildren called her, died in a comfortable retirement home in Elysia, no far from a basilica of a good Saint Teresa at the respectable age of 87, on the solstice of June 2002. Eleanor died in a sleep, a natural painless death, as Dr. Rode said. But her eldest son, Jacques, who was 64 at the time, was very upset that she had received extreme anxiety. A month before her death, her dear mother had entrusted to him the clock brooch of his grandmother, Jeanne, and the sixth shooter from his paternal grandfather, the Wicked Model 1892, with its eight millimeters lead bullets with copper cartridges. These objects are in the safe of a blue bird in the main house at Mont Saint Michel. Jacques, you must guard them with your life until your death and give them to your eldest son so that he may in turn leave them to his descendants. In fact, Jacques uh, Rictoud had two sons. The elder Pierre was a brilliant citizen who had gone to the best military academy in France. He was born in 1972, was 30 years old, and already was a police captain stationed in the Nîmes region, a disagreeable posting for the Norman. He was appalled by the comportment of the local population, of which a good portion weren't of French origins. His wife had given birth to a daughter in 2000. They named her Jeanne in memory of a great great grandmother, Jeanne d'Aubray. An only child, Jeanne Rictou lost her father at the age of her maturity in 2018. Police officer, he was killed, run over deliberately by a stolen car amidst the enormous insurrection riots that arose the year in France, particularly in the South. They mainly involved the Muslim immigrant population whose demand grew harsher every year. Profoundly shocked and really depressive, Jean's mother Marianne put an end to her days a few weeks later. Among other things, Jean inherited the blue bird, the vacation house on Mount Saint Michel, which was far too large for a girl like her. Before the tragic deaths, her parents had rented a young bachelorette studio in the suburbs, so she could start a degree at a business school. The secret goal, once she had her diploma in hand, was to leave La Douce France, where life seemed to, to her more and more unbearable, and to emigrate somewhere. As unfortunately, most of the bright young native French of her generation were doing. But the brutal death of her parents put an end to her plans. She couldn't see spending several years in the hell of the Paris heritage had become. Endemic crime and insecurity, unemployment rates constantly increasing, the slow impoverishment of middle classes, suck drive of income sales tax, and everything floating on a base of persistent economic anemia. A pretty young girl on her own, she lived in a constant fear, barricading herself in a studio in Aulnay sous Bois in the same place where she had heard one of her ancestors had lived, and which had been a paradise of time, the moment night fell. How, she asked herself, could a country, blessed by God as France had been, could get into this state? Deep down, she was sure she was living out the last years of a world that wouldn't be standing long. In 2018, she finally made the decision to throw everything away and go settle in, in, settle in at the Blue Bird or Mont Saint Michel. But at least there was still a heaven of peace. With her inheritance, she set up the beginning of a business. She sold souvenirs to the tourists who visited the Mont in their dense halls. It might bring in enough to live decently. She set up a boutique in the ground floor of the house and in the safe on the second floor where the revolver and the precious brooch watch that had come down from her great-great-grandparent and which she must leave to her children 
if she had any, of a purpose that was completely unknown. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I, I uh, oh yes, uh, Michael. I'll, I'll sort of I, I, over to, 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 to you. Shall we uh, leave it there and have a absolutely have a chat about, and have yeah. a, have a chat about it? Yeah. Um, I should be very interested to know what people think. I think it's a quite extraordinary piece of writing. I I agree. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm keen to see what happens, and that that's one of the most important <laughs> it things. It's an uh, unfortunate statement in the context of his work. I don't know if I am keen to see what happens, but uh, uh, the way uh, things are unfolding. But his, uh, I think there are two things about Fire. One is his ability to, um, his sensibility to developments in the world, uh, and to actualize them. He was always a realist. That if, by which I mean not just a realist in seeing the way politics develops, but in where he, making it real for real people. That this is not just a metaphysical discussion. This is really happening in your life. I think that's one very important thing. And the second thing that I find very interesting is, is attempting at least, I don't know how successful he was, I don't think he was, but at least attempting to posit a, a, a world where modernity and attachment to one's roots and nature are reconciled because it's a debate that usually doesn't take place, a discussion that doesn't take place. But there is, it seems to me, a huge contradiction between asserting, for example, your love of your country and at the same time modernizing it to the extent that it's unrecognizable um, or worshipping technology and at the same time saying you care for nature. And this, this debate hasn't taken place and should, I think. So th those are the two things that I, I would take out of out of that um, very, very powerful, I think, very powerful well, short uh, story. Michael, what was, was he um, uh, um, uh, a, a practised writer of fiction? Because he seemed extremely comfortable uh, and to use the form very well. I, I'm not... I, 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 I agree aware with you. A, no, not at all. Really, no, it was quite, quite right, not at all. Um, uh, he, he did produce, uh, at the time when he was still in Gress, a... a cartoon book i can't remember who the cartoonist was but he wrote the dialogue for it called not to have on guerre which is very dark when he was in his most nietzschean phase mm. and almost with glee projected the uh, atomic conflagration which would lead to a sort of new eurasia which had annihilated china and the united states mm. and the main character in that looks <laughs> remarkably like Guillaume Fai. And there's a kind of priest seer who sort of priest in this new religion who looks suspiciously like Alain de Benoit. Um, and so he had that enormous uh, fictional um, ability to, to write science fiction. He could have been a science fiction writer, I think. It was obviously there. And, and, and his ability with words was very impressive. So I mean, it was I mean, he, he, he'd had a very wide ranging career. I yeah, think he was yeah. on, on, on radio. On, yeah. on, yes. And the, the, was on, on a television program regularly, I, I, I believe, and, mm -hmm. uh, as well as being a, uh, you know, a journalist of, of, of no, and a, a personality really in France. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering, Michael, sorry to put in. No, you are, there any, are there any uh, truth in the rumours about his. Um, his career act, acting in adult films. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't investigated that. I could say for, from the point of view of his, um, how should I put this, uh, of his uh, attitude to sexual ethics, uh, I would say it's extremely possible. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't <laughs> really say more than I, I know that there was a story that was told to me just apocryphal, I don't know if it's true, of an irate husband who was banging on the door of his flat and he said, I can't come to see you, I'm in the bath, which was technically true, but he was in the bath with the man's wife. But I, 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 whether these stories are really true or not, I, I, I know that he was very... Um, in, in quotation marks, liberal on those sort of questions. If I could just say, you must never believe anything that is said about a radical conservative or. A oh, uh, yeah, quite. I, I, they spent the their, their enemies spend their whole life manufacturing 
total rubbish about them. I, I did and hear that story from you someone would who never, never believe any of it. Oh, I quite agree with you. I would. Yeah, also, it's, not, it's not really relevant. Yeah. No, that's, we'll, we'll play, blame Mick for, uh, no, no, for bringing that up. <laughs> no, I think it's important to. It's a very important thing to make because it, it's just a, a common tactic um, to, you know, make up stories about a political enemy, which we don't realise um, in England because we haven't done it too much until recently. We do now, but in other countries, it's been rife for ages. Okay, but Edith, I have to a little disclaimer on that because I think that his because I did know him uh, not very well, but I did know him. Um, his belief in in what we say Christian ethics about marriage and things like that was pretty well non-existent. Oh yeah, I think mm. he was pagan. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 and uh, from that point um, of view, and the second the story came from possibly a malicious gossip. Yes, but the person who told me the story was and still is quite active in what you might call the new right. So it wasn't, although that that particular person is known for malicious gossip, actually. Well, so. <laughs> well, 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 uh, uh, let, let, let's sort of change the, 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 the focus. Yeah, yeah. But what was it, it's quite a lot of attention to details of military life, uh, the, 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 the uh, caliber of ammunition and uh, uh, ranks and regiments. Was he very much fascinated by um, military history and technology? Uh, Nick or, or Michael, you know, I know that's right. my knowledge of him not. I remember him when the <laughs> Nouvelle Droit produced a very luxurious or coffee table edition of Napoleon. Uh, uh, he was very, very scornful of it, said we can do without this sort of nostalgic nonsense or something like that. So, oh, so not pas besoin. So, uh, I, from my knowledge, I would say almost not. But, uh. Oh, right. I mean, it was just something that struck me in the the details that, mm. that were quite salient yeah. in, in, in the it narrative. It struck me as well. Very know, much, um, very well researched. Um, obviously, the mm. the detail, may, the story. Maybe that that that's a theme that will appear in the the later stories that um uh what the, the militarism is perhaps something that was sort of hitherto or recently thought to be on on the wane that will it, it, according to his views be resurgent again in the future i don't know that might be a, a, mm. an issue um edith have, have you read the whole the whole collection i i have avoided doing so no no i haven't actually oh, okay. um so uh, okay. i'm eager to to read it all but i just just flicking through i got the impression that the um it tailed off a bit as it because it has to get more and more fantastical mm. you know and once it starts going into the future mm. you, you run into trouble really any writer does in, in my opinion especially if you're trying to do what fi was doing but i mean he did a really good job of in 1999 predicting what france would be like in 2008 now that was very, that was perceptive and that a clever person could do that but predicting 2021 21 20 i think you start mm. to run into trouble that's all but it will be interesting mm. to see how he could mm. I, I think the translation was very good there, there were no points that i i was conscious of it which is a sign of a good translation i was just carried along by thinking about the the, the story the characters the, the 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 times which i i i, I think i think was, was i um uh, i think the story itself is of course very didactic it's it's contrived to set out his views in a very overt uh, didactic way so in a yeah. sense it suffers as literature from a particular fault because if you write anything which is literary, effectual, but also very didactic. It's become, become pretty good. But I mean, it did have a certain um, uh, impact, efficacy. Um, I have um, a little anecdote about a true case of uh, fortune telling, um, namely someone um, who was told by a Sufi um, mystic in Afghanistan that he was going to die at the age of, um, I think, 82 or 83. And when he was told so, he was, um, he would have been uh, a younger man in his late 20s. Alas, the poor man died at the age of 52. So the Sufi was not fell short of the truth. 
But we know the fortune teller of a story, you know, it, it, the requirement is not that it should be an actual person, but it is, a, once again, a literary device. Mm. Um, I wanted to, um, harking back to archaeofuturism, um, I did not quite understand how, well, I can see the general trend of thought, how, well, I know what world of tradition is like, but how that would then, uh, in a way, project this after a future different affair. Uh, and uh, another point is, uh, I think during the short story... So, so sorry, I, I didn't quite... What, what no, did you I, say? I'm glad you asked. I didn't quite understand yeah, that could, point. Could, could you repeat that? I didn't quite catch catch the words. Yes, I, I'm not uh, quite clear yet in my mind uh, how you go you got this notion of archaeofuturist combined to different uh, uh, views uh, or realities. And uh, archaeo is a world of tradition that is quite clear. clear. Future, the future is uh, a, a future world which fits into a traditionalist perspective. Is that correct? So, but how you link the two, it was less clear to me. Uh, well, I'm uh, sorry, I, I, before sorry. you can answer yeah. uh, once I finish. The other thing I wanted to say was um, that um, was a reference to the, Di the Apollonia Dionysian um, dichotomy, which is, of course, made immensely famous by Nietzsche in his famous essay, Birth of Tragedy. Of course, Nietzsche later on, um, I read, explained that it is. In fact, it is not a matter of uh, two, um, two, uh, two sets clashing, but it's a combination. So the, true, the truly uh, uh, integrated person combined both, both the Apollonian, the rational and Dionysian, which, is, uh, which was beyond the rational. And finally, the final point, and then I shut up, is uh, that um, uh, Fay did not go as far as um, Michel Houellebecq did. He was a famous French writer mm -hmm. who, in his uh, uh, book La Submission, submission actually, postulates a future France which has become Muslim. The president is a Muslim. Yeah. So Fay can't really, didn't quite go as far as that. Mm -hmm. When was uh, Submission written? Um, well, at least, uh, I think it's at least five years ago. Even a bit more, I think, but yeah, I was going to yeah, say six I, or I seven it. years. In. Yeah. I think, yeah. Ooh, you made a lot of uh, uh, points. Oh, um, uh, Vladimir, yeah, Vladimir, I'd like to ask you, because you also applauded when uh, Father Frank said that the device of the, of the, of the fortune telling was a bit weak uh, uh, literally, so perhaps you could, yeah, uh, Vladimir, well, I think it's literally oh. in, a, it's a, it's a, it was affecting uh, in Faye's story, there is no question. It, it, it was very didactic and it was a projection of his view, but that's enough. Yes, I would like to add a couple of words. Uh, I used to know uh, Guillaume Fay in person uh, for about 20 years back in Paris, but I wouldn't like to say now, not too much about himself, any critical uh, words, but basically about archaeofuturism and this French edition of this movement. And then to my mind, the French are really historically uh, are opposing to, to Anglo-Saxon reality. And this we can see even nowadays that they try to build up sort of great Eurasia from, uh, from uh, Brest to Vladivostok, something like that. So they try to exclude Anglo-Saxon reality from this project, the UK and the United States, of course, and other, other countries of English speaking. I believe that this is completely wrong because, of, to my mind, if we speak about arc of futurism, something uh, like a new productive order, so we should somehow to reunite Germanic and Slavic people, uh, including Anglo-Saxons and Scandinavians, Germans and Poles, Russians and so forth. So Germanic and Anglo-Saxons, so they are, have something, a cultural ancestry also. And the Vikings are this historical point. The Vikings discovered uh, the North America. They went north, uh, westwards. And also they went eastwards. So these Russian Vikings, and they reached uh, Chukotka and, and Far East. And then in Alaska, they came together somehow. And I believe that 
this new erasure in terms of Guillaume Fay and other French uh, thinkers is something uh, a continental Europe is, as I said, excluding Anglo-Saxon civilization at all. But I guess it more, pro more productive should be speak about the Northern Hemisphere and uh, to unite Northern Eurasia, uh, that means like Russia, Scandinavia, UK, and other uh, Northern European countries, and the Northern America, Canada, maybe New England, and some other parts of United States, like culturally. It, this Northern Eurasia, uh, I mean, Northern Hemisphere should be much more productive and with a glacial ocean in the middle. So we can, we can just reestablish what I could say like a little bit uh, fantastically, like the this great Viking kingdom, uh, the kingdom of uh, Northern uh, rulers, so to say. Because Very good. If we take the, even the modern science speaking about futurism, we have the English, Anglo-Saxon and Russian science in arms, in physics, in mathematics, in everywhere. So that we, means this, this mentality is very, very common and very productive in the collaboration, uh, this English and uh, Russian science and science school. Yes, uh, uh, is, uh, in the Germans as well, so they have the same mentality and, and the Scandinavians. But as for Southern Europe, yes, they have their own culture. But it's somehow, it's already the past, I, I guess, in a certain way, this Catholicism and France and uh, Italy and uh, Latin America, they have their own uh, uh, area, of course. But in, in terms of uh, uh, strategic alliance, it should be better to find a way somehow to, to reunite uh, this Northern America and Northern Eurasia in certain way, and uh, that should that's my point. And then, if it's interesting, I I have even an English article uh, uh, describing that project, and and can I can provide it uh, if, if if necessary. For I, I I think you spoke about that at the uh, at the much missed uh, extremist club. Uh, exactly. Uh, yes. Very well, but yeah, that's... no, it, it's a good. A good point. John uh, like D kinship of latitudes. But, yes, the project um, of John D to reunite Russian Tsarandom and English uh, monarchy just and to, to establish that the global northern uh, monarchy uh, <laughs> on the base so, so, of uh, Moscow and London. Sadly, <laughs> we, 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 we don't have um, Guillaume Fry here to to answer that point, uh, uh, which is a great loss, I think. But um, mm -hmm. Um, oh, did... definitely, definitely, I'd Sorry. like to jump in there. If I, 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 I think, think yeah, uh, Mayran had his hand up first. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. If, if perhaps he'll, he'll um, ma yeah, Mayran. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want to make it short. Uh, I'm not so uh, familiar with the rationale behind this text and the reason and, uh, and so, but it was um, um, just recalling a lot of emotions uh, regarding. Future is, uh, I mean, uh, I have a very intense debate going on with uh, one of Sweden's most famous philosopher, Alexander Barth. You should maybe invite him. Alexander Barth? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh you, you know, mm -hmm. I can... Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one point is this, I mean, related to this futurist thing. And um, I mean, that, that's trying to take the control over the future and the storytelling about what's, what's going to happen and could be some kind of um, self-fulfilled prophecies. Mm, which yeah. is, uh, I mean, it is, it is politics and ideologies and psychological warfare. It is about actually about the, the, the war indeed. But the, the point is, you know, um, how to distinguish futurism from determinism and also ideology and how to, you know, free yourself from a lot of, you know, luggage, baggage and all, all, all that, you know, past thing haunting you. And, and when I, um, you know, listened to this, this text, it, you know, it was about, you know, a, 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 an echo from the past as if this war is not over. And this is what of 
But what I'm thinking about many times, I mean, I'm actually thinking uh -huh. about the 100 years war between uh, England and France. You know, a, a hundred year war uh, to that hundred year war to 116 years. And assuming that this war began 1914, maybe assuming a hundred years war, maybe assuming that war was not a 30 years war, I mean, World War One and Two, but rather a hundred years war, which we really don't understand what was it about. All that slaughter, young people and World War and all, all, all that thing, if it was a World War, we don't know what was that, that war. I want to relate to what Vladimir uh, talked about. Who were the Germans? And who were the British and who were the French and the Russians and Japanese and, and so on? We label them so low, so easy. But, you know, this discussion with Bart is about um, production of truth and reality and, and so on. And also the identity. That is the future project and who we are. And uh, then discussing, you know, is, is it, are we discussing determinism or future risk? And, uh, you know, all that in this, in this, in this reading talking about, you know, this civilization is, is gone. Mm. And it is so apocalyptic and it's so touching. Mm. I think that, that it's very important to talk about, you know, what it means to, you know, bring through a, a, a an apocalypse and apocalyptic times in a you know relatively peaceful mm -hmm. world which is you know uh, surrounding it is this part of of the world and being in sweden and from sweden maybe this futurism is about like you know taking photos you are just you know what do you call it? Uh, um, you know, just taking pages, and and just you know, um, uh, consuming possibilities, yeah. and just by telling them, you consume them, and they are discarded. Uh, yeah, so, thanks. So I, I I think it's a very important point you you make that predictions of the of the future help to shape the thoughts that lead to their realization. Yeah. I, I think that is is certainly true. Uh, you, you said, uh, 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 Michael, you, you, you wanted yeah, to... Yeah, uh, I, I feel quite strongly um, that the sort of confusion has arisen, which possibly one could argue is partly Fai's fault. And that is that there are three totally different elements and subjects here at play. Uh, one is future visions and how things inevitably happen, the Spenglerism, if you like, um, that there's going to be a morphology of civilization that inevitably declines, which is very strongly in Thai. Then there is completely separate, in my opinion, Thay's following of the theories of Tyria, which is in this Eurasia, this complex, which unfortunately, and I find unfortunately, it's very much part of his Archaeofuturism book. And therefore, a criticism of the Archaeofuturism may seem to be valid because it's a criticism of Tyria's belief in this Eurasia from which the Anglo-Saxon world is excluded. And that was followed by Yoki, of course, in Imperium. Now, that's the mm -hmm. second thing. And the third thing, and it's a completely different strand again, in my opinion, is archaeofuturism itself as this notion of reconciling nature and technology. So there are three totally different issues at play, and I think it's totally valid to discuss any one of them, but I think we're in danger of mixing them all up together so we don't have any clear idea of, of what's going on. But as I say, it's partly Fai's own fault because he mm -hmm. called his book Archaeotheorism and uh, the Futurism, and he threw in this belief in this pan-Eurasian empire. In fact, I think he even calls it the Eurasian empire. It has a name. I can't remember what it's called, but it is Tyria's yeah, well, what, what empire. It calls, sorry, yeah. what it call, calls it, Michael, it, it's actually, um, I think it's uh, Euro-Siberian. Oh, okay, to, uh, right, Euro-Siberian. It was something uh, like I that. Think, Thank I you. think yeah, it does yeah, make yeah. the distinction, so, you know... Um, and well, it was, was Tyria's thing of Brussels to Vladivostok, or Lisbon, always, Lisbon always, to Vladivostok, I think it was. 
Oh, okay. I, I always thought it was Dublin to Vladivostok. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Dublin to Ah, well, actually, that's an important difference. I didn't know the Brit yeah. British Isles were included there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. May I ask something? I mean, uh, if, if this uh, theory is true that this is about a hundred years war going on at least until 2030, being futuristic in some way, I mean, one distinction was about, yeah, I mean, it's from World War II, you know, the, the, the dispute between Germany and England, that I take of this continental thing, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an earthy power, and England and, and the US could remain at the seas. But okay, this is about, you know, some kind of dividing of the power. I, you 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 remain the sea power and I remain. Hmm. I mean, some kind of that. Yeah, that's very that very much in fight. That, that is very much in fight. I don't agree with you though that I I don't think five felt very strongly at all that it was this French idea. It was very much a French idea that there was a hundred years war that begins uh, with the Franco-Prussian War and ends with the um, Charles de Gaulle walking down the Champs Elysees and that was they considered that was the hundred years war between France and Germany. I would I'm fairly sure that Fay had a very low opinion of that conception, absolutely. And he he uses almost this as a sort of to show it, it's not really a hundred years war. He doesn't and it's a kind of they believed it was a kind of a trigger. But he did make one historical mistake, didn't he? I think it was um, pretty sure it was uh, Britain that declared war on Germany, wasn't it, in August 1914? But okay, that's a small yeah, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, Can I just ask, uh, um, did he do his own translation? No, I don't think he did. No. So um, I'm just wondering who the uh, translation was. His English wouldn't oh, have been good enough. No. How, that was filtered, how that was filtered through to. It's done English. by Anne, Anne Stetzinger. Anne Stetzinger. Do you know anything mm -hmm. about her? No, no. But probably a, a pseudonym. I Quite possibly a pseudonym. Yeah. I French no. new writer have got. Mer not, I think they're all pseudonymous for every French new writer. Well, sometimes uh, the Mick. meanings are filtered through translators, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Linda, what did you think of the of the quality of the English translation as uh, uh, not having read the original? I thought but... the quality was, was good. I'd like to see the original French. I'd like to have a look at it and re read the story in the original French and just see how. It compares, yeah. but I'm just always interested when something's written, you get a filter of a translator because they can't, under can't quite understand the concepts of the yeah. original writer. Um, it, was, it was definitely an American translator, I think. American. Where, 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 yeah, and particularly that exited something, which is very yeah. American. Yeah, there was a couple so of words. Of there were a couple of got, words here. Gotten. Got, I always know. Oh, yes, gotten. Yeah, gotten, yeah, yeah. That's gotten, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I also yeah. wanted to ask, though. Um, within not just within fire but within arc of futurism what there's no is there a place for spirituality i know there was a comment there was a something oh yeah about, yeah you know, I, I, absolutely yeah i, I, I was just wondering sorry if he, had, if he had an interest himself in spiritualism i don't mean with you know with thought thinking he's pagan and, and he's got quite a few interesting theories in there but the fortune telling, yeah, as a device, can be used a lot, and it's used a lot in French literature and in French film. If you look at the French New Wave, there's lots of fortune tellers and tower readers that pop up in French New Wave, wave cinema. Um, but mm -hmm. he, he took the fortune teller quite seriously. What she was saying is going to come into play, rather than just using them as a, a, a usually and often tower readers, fortune tellers, a, a mock or use as a form of comedy and you know they get things wrong or they, they're there just for, uh, for the horror for the shock factor and i'm just wondering yeah. if you had any interest in, in spiritualism so, so you're you're asking is uh, did did he actually believe in in the prophetic as a sort of yeah, something that was a real it? phenomenon yeah mm -hmm. um that's a, that's a good question because i was is, also yeah. a little surprised i would have he tended to be quite hard realist as far as i remember him and that surprised me a little bit as well. And I was asking myself almost your question, I think, is this just a, a technique or does he sort of believe in it himself? Um, so I if think anybody it's, is, just, it's yeah. just a device. Right, just get, a device, you think? Yeah. It's a device to try and get people to understand that um, he's thinking post-catastrophe, um, which actually nobody here, even though it was... Uh, you know, it was repeated over and over again in the in the definition of it that I read at the beginning, and Fai himself also kept repeating it that his ideas are post catastrophic. So the first 
story is about the <coughs> catastrophe <coughs> has happened. It happened in 1914. And we're all cat we're, we're all playing catch up. And I, I never knew Fi, of course, but I mean, I've known loads of people who have been trying to get other Europeans to, uh, and Occidentals to understand that, you know, we're going the way of ancient Rome and Islam and um, Persia and China in past centuries that, and um, the Mayan civilization. It, it's very difficult for us living now to actually project our heads into a post-catastrophic vision. Um, and so that's why it's a paradox that Phi is clinging to the RK um, because, and that, that rather misleads us because he's saying, well, you've got to salvage something, but nothing, I'm not talking about anything that can happen before the catastrophe. You have to wait for the catastrophe. And then after that, you pick up, and I see the Iranian, are you Persian, Mehran? Or, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm about to go to an exhibition in London, if I can even get in, because it's always booked up, called Epic Iran. It goes back 5,000 years. Well, I don't, I only know from the Old Testament, but it strikes me that Persia and Baghdad have collapsed more than once. But they sure. picked up the pieces and they've gone forward, but they've always salvaged something of the RK. And I do know a bit about the most recent collapsed civilization, Islam. And it always fascinated me that it could collapse in the, you know, sort of it started, and it was a long collapse, you know, from say 1400 to 1800. It took its time, the collapse, it was slow, but it was a total collapse. Yeah, the um, catastrophe is actually going then, on. Yeah. But then, sorry, if I could just finish. And but then it's got a sort of um, in now it's back. Islam is back, but it's in a different form, and it's very high tech and it's very futuristic. Whether but they're the people who now you can have I can have a conversation with about how do you salvage your civilization because it's just happened to them. You know, I mean, you could have it with a Greek person, obviously, or an Iranian, but because Islam is the most recent collapse, it's actually, they're still very conscious it, it, of it. Uh, Edith, is that what it, Muslims think, that, that their, their civilization is, is post-collapse? I, I, I wasn't aware of that, that that's how um, they thought of it. I, 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 well, of course just, it is. It's not, a, it's not an opinion. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm just asking how they perceive it themselves. I oh, they, individual that. Muslims may not, I mean, I'm t obviously I'm talking about ones who know their history. I mean, obviously, if you, uh, but, but I think they're probably dimly aware that mm. they're, there was a major collapse from the golden days of its, the Islamic yeah, Empire. Yeah, yeah. Because you've really got to look around you. I mean, look at the archaeology from Morocco and Spain, mm. from the Alhambra to, you know, Persia. There's all these buildings. So they must all be mm. conscious that at one time, as the British... Uh, Mehran, did you want to say, say something about uh, just, that? Uh, just um, a short comment to, to edit, uh, should write. Uh, to my view, uh, Islam is about a destructing, a destructive power, a pure destruction. It's some kind of Kali Shakti to Iran and this, you know, I Iranian empire. Is, Islam was designed for destroying Iran or reconquering Iran. I mean, never forget, most of these kind of religions were a product of, uh, you know, palace intrigues between Sassanid empire and the empire before. Sassanids, they were Zarathustrians, very diehard, but before them, the Parthians, which took over after Seleucids, they were Mithraic. So I think we should have a, a great, we could have a great talk with Georgiani again mm, about yeah. you know the emergence of Islam and what was it really about this, this project because there were many Iranians in, involved, well, yes, but, but it but, was, but, you but, know, the Mazdakian and the Manikian. Yeah, I know, but, but 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 we we Europeans, we are fate, we are living through of course, a, a of course. collapse that started. Most people agree. Well, actually, before 1914. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, 1914 was the end, and and uh, we we still don't. Most of us still don't realize that we're still carrying on as if 
somehow there's some sort of progress, there's growth, there's something. I mean, madness. And, 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 and could, could and ask, he um, says for, for, in his story, uh, he mocks progress, uh, he mocks Victor Hugo in his stupid poem entitled, he mocks his stupid poem mm. entitled The Twentieth Century, uh, a century of infinite peace mm. and progress. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and of course, it was complete, he was completely wrong. Mm. Edith, um, could I just ask Father Frank uh, about the, the, this idea of... of of uh, uh, is in, in Islam because I think he's quite au fait with a lot of, uh, of of Islamic intellectuals about whether they they perceive uh, their their culture as, as somehow having come back from a collapse. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Well, actually, I was um, <laughs> thinking of Hegel, who um, early in the nineteenth century um, he writes about Islam having. Um, fallen into a torpor from which he, he will never awake. For Hegel, Islam was finished. But history proved him wrong, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, when you ask how Muslims, well, the well, important thing to remember, Islam is not monolithic. Yeah, yeah. There are, um, I mean, uh, if you ask, um, you know, Osama bin Laden, uh, his view of Islam was very vigorous, but he thought of Islam was under attack from the West, and indeed uh, the, the great sermon of one of the, of the chief imam in Mecca years ago, he addressed the Haji, the pilgrim, say, the West wants to destroy Islam. And that was after 9-11. So um, there is this um, apocalyptic view, which is um, partly self-interested, because if you portray yourself as an attacker, as a victim, you can actually, you have a, your entitled hit back. Um, I think um, uh, there are also a number of Muslims who have been uh, quite happily absorbed into the Western progressive liberal secular worldview. <laughs> so they do quite well. I mean, uh, you know, in this country, we call Nazim Zarqawi, whom I think is uh, the minister in charge of or the virus, who is a, a model of a political integration into the system. They do quite well. That is the reality. Many of them will come forth. But, but I think, uh, and also there is a split between the Shia and uh, Sunnis, uh, which is an internally science struggle. But I mean, I think the strength of Islam is this, in my opinion, that it, yeah. it is still conserves by, on the whole, some traditional values the main one of which is the family. So you still have this element of, uh, you know, you have a structure, a unit, which is a family at the end of the day is a fundamental unit of society, whether I mean, I'm not married, I never wanted to be married. <laughs> I've always been a kind of ment uh, spiritual monk, so to speak. But, but I mean, at the same time, socially speaking, the family is fundamental. So Islam has not given up a family notion in Islam still persists. But and the I West think that is one of the greatest yeah, really? But it's that's why they see the West as the great destroyer. It's precisely that reason because <clears throat> westernization going in, I've seen it in all all across the Islamic world, the great destroyer as it destroys our culture, progress technology and Fry spotted this in fact I think towards the end of his life he stopped being anti-Islamic for that reason because he suddenly realized oh my goodness but they're they're complaining about the same thing that we are that liquid modernity egalitarian modernity the great Satan is egalitarian modernity or liquid modernity and it destroys the archi. And that's whether the archi is uh, Viking or Russia or whatever it is. It could be Chinese, it could be Iranian. For every nation, liquid modernity, egalitarian modernity and technology without morals just erases, it rubs out you know, everything, family, tradition, yes. morals, nature, the lot. And you, I mean, a lot of Arabs have spotted that, a lot of 
uh, and not just Arabs, I mean, a lot of Muslims, you know, there's the same, a lot of Chinese have spotted it. There's the same resistance all over the world to egalitarian modernity because it, it doesn't deliver the freedom that it promises. It also, it, um, very briefly, to add to one fundamental strength of Islam is its preservation of a model of a Quran. The, the idea that there is a book which is directly revealed from on high and which is memorized, which is read, which is studied, which is memorized, which supplies a constant store of phrases, of sentences, of words which can be used to shape your has, mind and life. But it hasn't may, defended may. them against modernity. You ask people in Saudi Arabia or Egypt whether it's defended them against, uh, you know, um, Porn, promiscuity, uh, consumerism, pollution. Well, I mean, uh, it it if let's them. not idealize too much the actual conduct of Muslims because yeah, they may actually just, go in just, for a lot of stuff. Like everybody, that. May I just it has... say something. I mean, I, I was not finished with my answer to Edith. There's two distinctions Islam versus Iran. We are talking about you're going to visit that exhibition. Look at this way. It's about what we in, inside Iran, under the realm of so-called Islam, and that's why the traditional Islamists are not, they're not against West. They're against Iranians. They're against Persians. ISIS, oh, yes. they're, I they're, know. They're, and they have nothing, <laughs> I know they have that. nothing I... against, nothing against West. Well, I mean, the, but they're the, uh, purely Western-backed. And I a just, lot of us, yes, yes, yes. Please, but we'll please, let's, think that anyway let, because let, 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 let we finish. are against Christianity because yes, I know, I know. I'm, 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 I'm against Christianity, Ju Judaism, and all Abrahamic world. According to the Iranian Renaissance and Iranian thinking, all these religions are part of a three thousand years assault of Ahriman to paradise. What is paradise? It's an Iranian word for Iran, nothing else. This is, I mean, Abrahamic religions, all of them are completely distorting the yeah, history but we, and we, the we future know, we know, in their in I the know, but we know all that. Yeah, know I know that. that. I know that. But you were talking about Baghdad as the. No, we, we're trying to understand how. Um, you know, what, um, how to grapple with a c collapsing civilization. Should we just go to sleep I, like this? I, I was, I, did. Or... I was trying to address that, but you, you don't let me to finish. First one, Iran conquered Babylonia, right? And Babylonia became the center of Iranian empire for the first time during the Achaemenid time. And then it was, you know, the, the uh, collapse from Alexander, which is a great disaster, apocalypse in Iranian mindset. And then you have the, the, this uh, uh, Seleucids, and then, um, uh, then you had the rise again, Conquer, reconquering Baghdad, reconquering Babylon. Babylon is the same as the center of the Iranian empire for the second time. And it collapsed after the Islamic assault. And at this very speaking moment, Iranians are aiming on Baghdad again. The, 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 the very, the very, uh, very um, core of this Iranian Renaissance is we are going to reconquer Baghdad. Tehran <laughs> is not our uh, our uh, center. Baghdad is our center, and that's the that's the very core of the conflict between U.S. and Iran. So Iran is. Behind this curtain of Shia, which is completely bullshit, we're try trying to reconquer Iraq as also a Shia company. <laughs> and all, all that, all that thing, Shia means nothing. It's about Iran. It's about, about yes. Iran from Kabul to Morocco. This is this this is this is the this is the deal. This is what you know the all those Russians are talking about, Eurasia. We have yeah. our minds completely clear. But Northern India to, to uh, uh, Atlantic coast. This is Iran. 
for us. But you know, that's the old way of doing things. I think Fry was trying to look for a new way of doing things and not just go through the whole old thing all over and over. No, 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 it's, it's, over about, it's, a, it's about finishing Islam. It's about finishing Islam once and forever in the name of Islam, of course. Of course, we have learned our, our lesson. That's we, we are called Shia. I'm not Shia. Shia means party. I can make a party anytime, a new party, a party of the party, and so on. And that, that is the core of the Germans. Yes, but you're they're still Faustians. Have... They're Faustians. Yes, we should talk you about won't, You won't have solved any problems. You won't have solved the problem uh, that progress and high technology destroy the RK and they destroy nature and you won't have solved that problem and what I, I'm just I'm sorry to get a bit mad but I'm a bit disappointed that this is simply not even getting off the ground because what, what, what? Um, sorry what, what's not getting off the ground well the, the the discussion because we have to start from the the base that Fi proposed which is really quite new is that to avoid this eternal cycle of civilizations collapsing and then reviving or not reviving or whatever, you have to tr somehow try and marry um, the archae and the, the biology, the, the earth which uh, feeds us all, with a measure of, te of techno technological, not progress, but movement, which um, doesn't destroy the archae and nature i mean it's really you, uh, well, I mean, you're you're, so I you're, don't you're assuming that by some mental um uh mental um for, formulation we, we 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 can avoid failing and i i i, I would disagree no, I, I don't, don't because nobody I, can know. even understand what i was trying to get at they're obviously uh, not understanding but, uh, so I mean, there's obviously it's not going to happen anyway. Why? Why would it happen? But I just think he's got a point that um, you know, once once you have um, once a civilization has collapsed, it has a chance has a chance to hang on to its archie and yet not go back to mud huts. Because, you know, whenever people say, oh, we're destroying nature and we're destroying morals, they just snap at you. I mean, it's happened to me loads of times. Oh, so you want to go back to mud huts mm -hmm. and whatever. But, you know, Fais trying to say, no, look, you haven't thought about it enough. It, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but you do have to say to technology, look, hang on a minute. Just don't, you can't destroy all the foundations uh, of your civilization, mm. which will last even after the collapse, and that, but that's what you're doing, and nobody's saying it. Nobody's querying growth. They're just starting to uh, query growth. They're just starting to query progress. But I, um, I think lo lo loads of people are, are expressing reservations, to put it mildly. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, it, but, it's, but it's a very widespread any, thing. All they can, it's all criticism, isn't it? It's all saying. Um, you know this, but but you know, no, I, I wouldn't I say so. Just, just, just tell me, uh, let me say something. I think this technology versus nature, or I, I think technology is in the hand of the war industry, and it's um, sorry okay. to say. So we have to talk about how to, you know, shift. Okay, this. thanks. Uh, sorry, um, uh, thanks very much for coming along, uh, Linda. Thank, thanks for reading and. Mm. Uh, Obviously, cat, cats need, need, need their food, don't they? As, as we do, we'll have to stop soon to have they some do. dinner. But, <laughs> it's uh, Sunday, they close at 4.30. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I, 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 bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, mean the, I think it's a tribute to this work and his life, really. He, he, he brought many, many uh, themes t together and... Uh, 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 put forward questions that certainly need to be answered, and I, I think he's, you know, possibly in this book, you know, has has um, constructed a, a, a narrative where, where, where some of them will um, uh, represent themselves no, very well to our mind. Open a door. That's all he did, and nobody, well, was, no, everybody just keeps slamming it shut. You know, he just opened a door. Well, not not not, not not no one. I mean, he, his books have sold, and he's a, he's an important figure, and he uh, uh, and I he can't still is. See that anybody wants to really grapple with the you know the the, the notion okay. of, of um I, 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 I can't I haven't come across anybody else apart from him who wants to even grapple with the notion that you can have your cake and eat it as it were that you can. Um, 
conserve um, nature and. Um, I, I, I find that attitude very, very, very common. That, that uh, particularly in um, altitude groups, for instance, uh, uh, S Steve McNallan's book about altitude, and he's one of the the most well known uh, proponents of that spiritual path. Just explicitly talks about the importance of. Um, harnessing technology this is our religious mission to actually um, go beyond our present capabilities and and, and sites um, space e uh, exploration as, 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 as being a really in important thing to do at the same time keeping true to ancestral values uh, I know other places that, yeah I, 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 I disagree with you Edie. I think lots of people mm, but... have said the same thing um, M M M Michael, um, would, you, would you like to? Yes, I, I sort of in the silent. middle between you two on that. Um, uh, I, I think when you say lots of people, you say perhaps a little bit too optimistically, and perhaps Edith is being a trifle pessimistic. Um, so I would find myself in, <laughs> in the middle of that. I think it's absolutely right that Fai's opened this door, and I think it's absolutely right um, that the desperately, really desperately, um, for the sake of the planet, not even just for the sake of us, needs to be some kind of a connection and understanding of harmonization between uh, the environment and nature and uh, the ability of humankind which has existed since at least 1944 to completely destroy the planet so that at the best only microbes and cockroaches will survive and maybe with luck with luck something like the human being intelligence can develop in another billion years before the sun becomes too big mm. to sustain any life at all one thing but that strikes me, I haven't quite finished. Yeah. Uh, one thing yeah, go on, yeah, that's very uh, significant in this inability, this block, is if you take very generally the uh, mantra of leading British politicians about progress, that the current prime minister in progress, he almost wants to fall on his knees, growth, you know, it really is the thing to which they make the genuflexion in a religious way. And uh, you take at the other end something like Extinction Rebellion and so on, which entirely refuses to see or to answer the questions of how people are supposed to live happily in a society in which all technological attributes have been dismantled. Then you see how far we are from reaching any kind of harmony or even the beginning of a proper discussion. So mm. while you're quite right, uh, Stead, that several people do, and there I'm a tad more optimistic than Edith, nevertheless it's true, that that kind of discussion, uh, which we're just beginning to have now, for example, is not really an open discourse, it seems to me. I know the complete block. If you ask someone from Extinction Rebellion to speak with some sort of right winger, uh, it, it just completely is the dialogue of mutes. Uh, well, I, I, I think I, I probably understood archaic futurism as, as uh, arch archaic values with. Uh, futurist technology. I, I have not understood it as, as you have, Michael, in relation to uh, the um, ec ecological ad agenda of preserving the, the earth. And I, I, I um, what, what was that Fire's intention? I mean, I mean, did he did he speak explicitly about ecology? Because that I, I may have misunderstood. I may have got the wrong end of the stick. I thought it was essentially leading Homeric lives. You know with spacecraft and gene technology ai and uh, but at the same time lead, you know le le leading a life that is is honorable that uh, has a continuity in spiritual terms no it, 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 it's a long time since i've read his book um but i do remember that there is a two class society i think it's a two class society and the lower class leave a life, uh, lead a life which is uh, technologically very simple, as far as I remember, and it's something like from the Middle Ages. Mm. But they're quite happy. It's like uh, William Morris's News from Nowhere. Yeah. And William Norris, by the way, was a wonderful example of a sort of ecological dreamer who himself completely suppressed and ignored the, the, the economic realities that he must have been aware of because he himself owned a factory, as far as I remember, producing uh, see, producing uh, arsenic. Wallpaper. Wallpaper. Yeah, but uh, wallpaper is full of arsenic, and he had an enormous arsenic mining, which was itself an enormous ecological disaster of its time. So there's a big irony in that, is there not? And um, I think, that, yeah, but answer to your question briefly, Fai was very cynical about ecologists, and he made some remarks which I find completely up. Mm. Absolutely. I, wrong. I, I, but I think, the novel sorry, did, did include uh, this, as I say, this existence of a primitive uh, society alongside a high-tech society.
Mm. I uh, guess uh, the problem is not only ecology, but also overpopulation. That's the, yeah. the, the key problem. And Absolutely, the, the I totally agree, question, totally agree. We need the modern science, including the mm. family planning, for example, or something like that. And that just to stop overpopulation. Or even more extreme. That's, yeah. uh, in that case, maybe I just uh, take the, uh, the side of Bill Gates, the, uh, uh, like uh, to stop it in any, any, any price. Secondly, what I would like to, to, to add shortly, back, coming back to Islam, I would say that Shia Islam has much more common with the new Platonism and, and Gnosticism than even the Catholicism. And then remember Templars, they got the Gnostic initiation from, from Ismaili Muslims. So this exactly speaking about Islam, there are so many branches in, in Islam and some of them are really like we can say they are just gurus of, of Western European uh, uh, technology and science. Mm -hmm. so we, should, we should take everything in account. And mm -hmm. then what you think about Islam, that something you, united just one mass, because there are so many different branches in Islam. And then secondly, Islam is, they have their own esotericism there. And uh, the Islamic intellectuals, they are really like, it's very difficult to find these people. And then the Islamic culture has own esoterical parts. And it's not so egalitarian as uh, the modern Western culture. That's why it's, we should everything take into account in, in order to understand really the potential of even of is, is Islamic people. Yeah, I, I'd, um, I'd like to ask Dirk uh, as, as a former representative of the British uh, Transhumanist Society here, if he has any thoughts, having heard some of our discussion and, uh, and, 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 and the reading. Dirk, have you, have you uh, got any comments? Dirk, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you still there, Dirk? I, can, I obviously can't see you. But, uh... His name's there, but there's a cross through the microphone. Oh, right, yes. Uh, oh, he yeah, says yes, but he's, yeah, Dirk, he's have muted. You, have you, uh, have you, have you on mute? Uh, yeah, can you can yeah can can you unmute to uh, say something? Uh, I, um, I'm 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 going to assume that that for some reason you you, you can't. Maybe you're tied up with something. Um, uh, I, I I yeah possibly possibly we 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 should be thinking about sort of uh, putting those two. Oh, he's together. written something instead. Uh, simple transhumanism will ch oh it's gone up, gone away. I, there was something in Tra chat. Transhumanism yeah. will change human nature itself. That's a that's a um, apothemic. Yeah. May I add something about this transhumanist thing? Not that related. Uh, I mean, uh, when, when we are talking about futurism. One thing that concerns my interest from this Persian slash Swedish point of view or Nordic is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein mon I mean monster. Mm. This is about, you know, how we can combine pieces from different persons into a, a, a new body. And this is a so, sort of, you know, projection and, and outsourcing from a British female way of thinking and 200 years later, this is actually going to happen. This is the project, this is the agenda. You outsource, let your, you know, um, some kind of enemy or abject, you know, the Germans, let the Germans do that. So you let your, you know, counterpart, your antichrist do your job, and then you can, you know, have some kind of international. And that's some kind of Hegelian way of thinking, which is, you know, this kind of, you know, cultural uh, kit for this Northwestern European way of thinking. And that is, I call it, uh, you know, the Faustic way of thinking, you know, the, 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 the struggle for eternal life and what is eternalism and, uh, and so on. And that is very, very interesting. This is the future according to me. My so-called Shia, so-called Persian, so-called everything, but if you, you know, what, what is very interesting from, I mean, I, I really appreciate what Edith is uh, saying, is that, okay, clear your mind, you know, just try to see beyond all this, you know, bullshit. And yeah, see, yeah, that's, see that, right that tr we need to tell ourselves that uh, yeah, all the yeah, time yeah. in life. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Mehran. Yeah. So can Mary you hear me Shelley, now? Mary Shelley is the oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Dirk, we can hear you. Yes, we can, Dirk, yes. 
Okay, um, let, let me give you three examples of trans, the way the transhumanists could affect the future in the, in the quite near future. Um, first is Elon Musk is de developing, uh, developing a computer brain link, uh, which is, uh, it's, in, it's invasive, so it's very high bandwidth. Now, that's not, um, that's not a thing that will change the future. What will change the future is the way he's doing it. He's developing the technology to implant stuff in the brain very easily and, and quickly and fairly okay. But what it means is you can, you can activate or deactivate certain areas of the brain. So, for example, if you're feeling bored, you can turn up the dial to not bored. If you want to focus on something, you can turn up the focus dial. If you want to be obsessed, you can be obsessed. If you want to turn it right down, you can turn it right down. And that, that kind of um, control over your own mental states, you know, that, that, is, that would be a, a global game changer. Yeah, no idea Second, what that would result in. That's extraordinary. Yeah, sorry, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, for example, I, I use modafinil now, which is a drug. So when I'm at work and I'm doing a particular kind of work and I just want to focus and... I take the I take that drug. It gives me extra focus. It increases my short term memory, and generally it's a mood boost. So it, a, a difficult problem suddenly doesn't seem so difficult. It makes me more optimistic about it. And whenever I take it, I have a very good day, and it feels like I've done a lot and I've been lucky. And that's just a, a tiny. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what's coming. Mm, mm, mm. Um, second, the, the really big one is artificial intelligence or general artificial intelligence. And I would guess within maybe 15 to, to 25 years, we will have AIs that can exceed human capability in every sphere of intellect. Yeah. yeah. So there, there, were, there, were already, there was already an artificial intelligence experiment that read through scientific literature, proposed its own experiments and ran an automated laboratory to verify its findings. Another one looked at um, a compound pendulum flicking backwards and forwards and, de and deduced Newton's laws of motion. Now, that took us two and a half thousand years to do really, that. Really, it, really, took it, so, mean, it, it took the computer several hours. Now, all of these little things, they're all kind of patchwork at the moment. But sometime in the next 15 to 20 years, they'll all come together. And you'll have a kind of AI that marshals AIs to specific problems. Yeah. Another yeah. one is a um, possible ending of of aging in humans it looks like it may well be possible some people disagree some argue about it but again it's like all these things it's an argument right up to the point where it happens then it's history yeah 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 exactly um, and yeah, yeah. there's there's lots of these little things occurring that are like below the perception level of the vast majority of people and it will re render a lot of these questions irrelevant yeah yeah um, well, th thanks, thanks for, for that uh, um, sober description of, of what uh, we may just about uh, live long enough to see the beginnings of. Um, well, we've already seen the beginnings of it. Yeah, I That's mean... Very, yeah, very true. We have already seen the beginnings. Uh, but more it, than it, the beginnings, I suspect. It, yeah, things that we perhaps can't, can't imagine, uh, whereas I think up to now it's been things that we, we could have thought computers could do or well, well possibly not but um but I think uh, we're uh, going to have to increase our the supply of fresh water on the planet because several places are running out iran's running out argentina's running out malta's almost completely run out and mm. quite a lot of other places are running out of groundwater so mm. unless these machines can somehow te teach us not to need water well, well less I, people I, less people I, I was going to say if artificial intelligence can end aging you have a very stark choice uh, either you the whole world starves to death or everybody <laughs> is uh, automatically sterilized or uh, you exterminate no, no, most of the, very, most of the world no most of the world outside of africa is in demographic collapse at the moment india is at replacement rate fertility bangladesh is i think slightly below it yeah, Iran I've... is well below replacement rate. Russia is below replacement rate. China is below replacement rate. Japan is below. One billion, so that's not collapse. Um, well, well, maybe, but the, but the so point the is, it needs to go back to one billion to be to have point... enough water. No, the point is the world is not overpopulated, and um... <laughs> you're joking. <laughs> Come on, you... you're not right, serious. You... That that is really you... outrageous. That is, In excuse the... me, an I... outrageous <laughs> statement. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've flown hard. over Siberia and you can look out the window for hours and see no sign of human habitation whatsoever. 
Yeah. Same with Canada. Yeah, you can see Iberia, plenty of human exactly. pollution. That's, these are reservations. We should uh, really to close them completely and uh, uh, and save it because exactly Siberia, Canada, maybe Brazil and Mongolia and Tibet. That's are just the the reservations for the future of humanity. I yeah, guess. and most of Africa is empty as well. Africa, most of Africa is not Af empty. Central Africa, yes, probably as well. It's a and desert. Oh, really? The rest of Africa so, what, is not empty. I worked tell, in well, Kenya. Tell me, tell, me, tell, me I, what, tell me what the population and size of Algeria is then. Enormous. I've or no Saudi idea. Arabia. Yeah, it's, the it's, desert. It's, uh, desert. It's empty. Uh, give any sense? Yeah, there's there's plenty of space. And the we can use that. The space, well, well, are you going to go and live there and have your house the green, in the middle of the Algeria? Is that point. The, the most important you? is the green, the, the oxygen, not, not the, the space itself. All right. And, and another example, if you, if you look at high-tech farming, you don't do it by throwing stuff into a field and hoping the, the rain's going to fall on it. High-tech farming can get you 10 times the, um, the productivity per hectare that regular old-fashioned farming can do. But it's not... Um, it's not economical or rather it's not being pushed because there's no need for it the world has enough food it's just the distribution of it that's the problem well the uh, food of america for example uh, america only produces enough food because of the amount of chemicals that it has to and pesticides and herbicides that it has to pump into the agriculture and it was stated i think even by the agriculture minister at the time who had the amazing name of but uh, that uh, if that wasn't done, America wouldn't have enough food to feed itself well, yeah, the, in any the, the way big, whatsoever. The big bottleneck of the future is cheap energy. If we can get cheap energy, then anything's possible. If we can't, then there's going to be a big problem. The problem with high tech should help us and the modern science. And then there are uh, the modern science is something very, very it's like an editorial thing. Not everybody are capable to understand modern science. Not everybody is capable to just to operate with modern math and programming and that's everything like true. that. And we should keep those scientific centers. I guess that's the only solution for for the whole humanity in any way. In any way, just no science, there would be a catastrophe. This is a failure of education. I mean, why why do people have opinions on nuclear power when they don't know what uranium two three eight is? Oh, well, it's that insane. would be like, no, no, no. <laughs> that would be like saying, why should people criticize a chair because they're not carpenters? Well, exactly. Yeah, you think people shouldn't criticize a chair if they're not carpenters. People well, I'm shouldn't sitting, I'm criticize a house if they're not architects. People shouldn't criticize a doctor if they haven't got a medical qualification. This is exactly the kind of elitist, <laughs> nihilistic thought which is creating the major problems that we are facing. That is what I'm hearing from you. This well, is not the case. Let, let me, let, let, it is, let me no, be more it's not let me be, let me be more specific then. You know, if you don't sort understand of what it, if you don't understand what radio what radio materials are, if you don't understand this, is exactly why the can kind you have an dialogue. opinion on why can you have an opinion on the, the relative dangers of uh, energy sources? Well, you can have an opinion. Or is it just radiation bad? You know, that's it. You can have well. I think some people might find radiation bad. I think the people in uh, Hiroshima might have something to say about the effects of radiation, even if they don't ex understand the technology of the atomic bomb. Well, would they have anything to say about radiation hormesis? Do they would probably is? be dead. Uh, but, no. But, but this this is exactly the sort of argument that it allows a kind of elite to rule the world and prevent the population from participating in political decision making. It is exactly that kind of argument which is behind the um, elitist thrust. Well, you've just been I, arguing about, about egalitarian I, modernism. If, I mean, if, if I could so, so, you know, come, I come mean, it really makes me quite to, angry. To, uh, That's the first thing that um, I've ever heard at any of our talks. So that really makes me angry. I, 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 I uh, with, with, uh, you, uh, with, with, you know, with, with, with respect, of course, I, 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 I kind of, I don't think that that wasn't how I took what Dirk was saying, really, which was that, uh, uh, I mean, there, there is a tendency I think we all have is to enjoy having opinions about things without necessarily knowing knowing them as intimately as, as, as we, we might. And I, I think if one is going to uh, 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 have an opinion about something, it is a good idea to become acquainted with the facts of it well, as yes, far but, as one but can. Yes, but when you're not, you get, you get yeah. 5G uh, 
Radio I, I'm just going to cite the 5G thing. Burn uh, yeah, burn Pete, the bastards down. Absolutely Pete, fantastic. I wish Pete, you would. Yeah, I'm you know, totally Pete, for it. I have full support the um, people. Without really knowing what, what, what 5G is, you know. Um, yeah, no, 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 this is exactly right. But look, well, it's this, like all like the arguments of... against 4G, 3G, 2G uh, and Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, this kind basically. of argument is the very argument that destroys democracy because the argument that destroys democracy is this, how can you vote if you don't understand anything about politics? So with that argument, you don't allow people to vote because they're too stupid. I mean, we, we had that, of course, with Brexit was a classic example. Um, the, the undertone of the Remainer argument was how could these thickos with beer bellies be allowed to vote at all they don't speak proper do they <laughs> sorry the, 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 it seems that the whole whole tone of this discussion up to now by everybody has been rejection of egalitarian modernism and what you're just claiming is like uh, egalitarian modernism is the thing we want now you've got to make up your minds about that um i i, I think in relation to um elections i mean i i i would say that uh, uh it doesn't make any sense if someone is voting and they are not able to say anything about the choices that they're choosing between. In relation to the Brexit election, that wasn't the case because lots of people had uh, opinions uh, about Brexit. Uh, they, they understood that, that they were leaving or remaining. People did have opinions about this. Um, it, it, I, I, I think it would be like um, a, 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 a more um, uh, salient case would be that of voting in a general election uh, and have no idea really about anything, any any of the programmes that the parties one was voting for at well, all. No, the, who the, was, problem, you know, the problem about Brexit was that both sides were correct. They were just arguing for completely different things. The Remainers were correct in that they may well lower our standard of living and cost money. The, the Leavers were correct in that mm. it, it regains some of our sovereignty. That, you know, they're arguing about apples and oranges. There's, there's no meeting point. Yeah, um, maybe. I mean, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, we, we've, we, we've, cut, we've really got uh, away from the... the, the... We've got away from fire a little bit, except, so. except, except up to one point. Um, I, I think that Fai was aware of uh, this need to balance uh, some kind of, I'll go back to the point that I was saying, uh, um, an awareness of ecological harmony and that, that it created a problem in terms of its possible conflict with technological mm. advance and I, I and I think that that that, that is yeah. to be found in fire. Absolutely and I think Dirk has actually um, provided a very good example of what fire he wasn't against um, you know um, what Dirk po possibly embodies I don't know because I'm you know but he, he spoke very uh, clearly um, and, you know, obviously, Fai, he wasn't against it, but he saw that it unknowingly, unwittingly, it does harms, which mm. it doesn't seem to be aware of or doesn't care about. And he was trying to um, just get a conversation with people like Elon Musk, maybe, who perhaps does mm. embody, you know, that kind of Promethean spirit. And, you know, because Faye was worried about it, you know, and, and I, particularly in the Arab and Islamic world where they've, you know, their industrial revolution happened much faster than ours. It blew them apart. You know, one minute they were in a traditional society with lovely markets, with fresh food and women mm. staying at home, looking after the children. Everything was, you know, I mean, they were bad things, but and then suddenly, woof. They're in the, you know, it, um, and so, and but with us it happened. But but what which what Fai is trying to say, I almost see him as a knight in shining armor, really, because he's trying to say, look, you know, Prometheus, wonderful, you know, um, mm. but 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 um, and it's wonderful, you know, that people are so clever and they invent all these things and they can go to space. But you know, could you just stop and think about? The just please, and not and not just once a year, once a minute. Try well, yes, but the, the problem is what it is that you you're... can think, but you can't stop. Yes, you can. Yeah, no, that is, that is the point. Can. Thinking just doesn't what we think doesn't directly sort of. Uh, uh, no, uh, but I think that's silly. Could, could, could I just slightly stop? Could I say um, what was he personally? Someone who who had conservative. 
views uh i mean did, did he resonate with the kind of uh uh, way in which life was lived in 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 the Homeric epics did that resonate with him? No, I don't think he. Well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, from those that knew him, I, I, I'm you know Mick uh, and uh, Michael. Uh, could you uh, be a bit more elaborate? Well, for instance, he, he 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 thought that there were certain spheres for men to act in and spheres for women to act in. Um, was well, yes, yes. Uh, quite comfortable with 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 the with the use of force possibly uh didn't didn't w w was not an egalitarian in that uh, it was believed there was a kind of a natural order of of peoples and priorities yeah oh. yeah i i, I certainly oh, believe very oh, much in the, in in the grass uh, yeah, idea I mean, idea of of rediscovering the ancient gods was very much in the forefront of this of, of this anti-Christian, anti-Western rhetoric that was hmm. particularly used by Gress at the time. And touching on the matter of artificial intelligence, he certainly in his um, rather grim, uh, also amusing, and not to have en guerre, there is a creature who appears who's been genetically engineered and uh, is, is used as a guard for the laboratory where they're making terrible experiments. And one of the people, this rather wet boyfriend, says, but it's not allowed by the Association to Genetic Engineering. The woman sort of laughs at him. So Fai's opinion at the time was obviously uh, very much in favour of that, or at least quite. But how he really stood and whether he possibly changed, because he changed his opinions after all quite a lot, um, yeah, Mike. Uh, but I mean, what, what was it? Was he a conservative in the senses that I've indicated? Uh, someone of. Well, I'm still not quite sure what, what kind. Well, of I, I I just said that at that point, for instance, about seeing specific roles for men and 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 for women. Yes, he that... was in that in that particular yeah. on that particular point. He was. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Uh, someone that perhaps w that wouldn't have been in favour of gay marriages. Oh, poof. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'd have to ask him. He'd have to. Yeah, be I, yeah. yeah. I, I, Mick, I, I, Mick, sorry, you, you wanted to. to... Yeah, I, I think what's interesting. I, I only met the guy once, and we just got very drunk and had a brilliant yeah. time. So, I, I, you know, uh, <laughs> so I'm not actually going to talk about that because, and that, that, that was quite entertaining. But I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but what what I find interesting at the end, uh, it's a long time since I read it, but I did actually proofread the original text. And I do remember the last part of the book is a, nove a novella, which. Um, it features a guy called Dmitry Oblomov, who, who narrates how Archeo future, what Archeo future is going to look like. And I think the, 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 the main narrative of the story is that there was an invasion in 2017, which is now obviously an historical time for us, mm. um, of an Islamic army, which melded with some ethnic gangs. And it took an army coming from Russia to actually retake Europe. So it's... Um, the very fact that the, the narrator is called Dmitry Oblomov, he's, I think he definitely is looking for some kind of um, you know, meeting with, with, with the Russian, um, you know, with, with what's happening in Russia at the time or what he perceived was going to happen in Russia. I find it quite interesting. That, I mean, the, I, I don't know if you know who Oblomov was. Um, he was a literary character in a, in a novel by Ivan Goncharov. And he was a guy who just couldn't he make. He slept any a lot, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, he, yeah. Couldn't, he couldn't make any decisions, and I always wonder if that if something, if, if that's what he was saying, is basically Europe has got to make a big decision, yeah, 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 or we're just all Oblomovs who might, with any luck, you know, come out the other side okay, as his character does in I think 2073, but it yeah, might be yeah. that. Um, you know, we, we just we just can't make any decisions at all. We let things happen to us, and it might go <laughs> completely the other way. So that oh, was just I my think that's that's the whole, whole essence. Development. That's the essence of the European Union. It it just regulates and regulates, and yes. it's it's, it's, yeah. it's essentially just a giant wet blanket over the. It has no arcade, no no guiding sort of principle that's animated. Right. Well, it. Yeah. it knows yeah. what it doesn't like. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. I, 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 th I think this has been a, a great tribute to the man. I think he would have uh, had a smile on his, his, his face and uh, we'd, he'd be passing the wine round now, I think, if, if, if he were here. But, uh, so, uh, um, M Michael, should we, should we um, uh, bring it to a, a halt what's been a very stimulating yeah. conversation and uh, allow a few of us to um, buy some cat food or, or whatever we need to do? Uh, <laughs> um, 
thanks, uh, Mehran, for, for coming on, and it's good to have your input. Uh, you know, someone who's, who's got a connection with Iran, which is a you know fascinating place. And uh, yeah, I um, uh, Edith, give me a, a you know, let's we'll be in touch when you're down into London. Let's have a let's, let's meet up. Uh, and thanks. Many, many thanks to Edith for yeah, for, thanks for for, for, for providing that uh, hors d'oeuvre. Yeah, yeah, impetus, yeah well, I hope we, it great. will be just an, uh, an order. I hope we'll go on because I really think it, it really needs, you know, a lot more mm. attention than it's getting. It yeah, really well, if, yeah, well, I mean, as I long as we can that. find something that's, that's a literary text or something visually powerful, because there is a good genre of visual yeah. art. Uh, there's loads of examples out there. M m very, 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 very... Uh, uh, exciting to look at, um, unless we can find that, I, I, I think, um, but yeah, which I'm sure we can. Uh, thanks very much, Vladimir. Thanks, Mick, as well. And thanks, Dirk, for, um, uh, for providing some um, input from your quite unique uh, position, really, and, and with, with, with your knowledge. Dirk will be giving a talk about transhumanism sometime, maybe in December, in, at our venue in, in London, I think, which will be a good in inflammatory subject for a moot so uh yeah i should i should try and pick the most inflammatory bit yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely well, well, instead but i hope you sort out the the, the 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 issues with people being physically there and, and online because the things are too too interesting too dr frankenstein patron saint of transhumanism yeah <laughs> Yeah, we, we've uh, so uh, uh, the next the next moot uh, because um, Ricardo had to transfer to uh, later on. So someone has come in a, a short notice who wanted to give a presentation. So Andre is going to talk about some of his ideas for um, Nordlandia. That'll be on the 18th. That that will be at, at seven uh, on a Wednesday. That yeah, uh, I'm, I haven't booked the space at the. Uh, at, at the at the venue so it's, and i think and after that the next moot will be um dr conrad Els to be talking about flemish paganism but he's a noted um indiologist and, and and yeah worth talking about different things and there'll be a bloat at the end of the month as normal focusing on the um spirits of, of, of the air particularly the birds and the and, and the image of the raven which is which is extremely powerful in our tradition and, right, and fi then. finally, last, Sorry, go on. Uh, no, absolute last point uh, for people who feel stimulated or enjoyed this sort of real meeting. I uh, do think if you know anybody, particularly anybody who's sitting alone, mm. isolated in the middle of well, the Sahara Desert, hang on, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if you'd like to use modern technology to to come on. Um, we definitely would be fine if we had a few more people coming to the sort of real meetings. This was quite a large meeting by our standards, mm. but I still think it could be one or two more wouldn't hurt. Um, but think about that. Yeah. And also those, uh, Mehran, uh, Vladimir, Mick, maybe there's a topic you'd like to uh, introduce and have some readings about. So bear that in mind and please get in touch if any ideas. I can just uh, add something. I yeah. mean, uh, according to what PCM, we, I, I don't know what. what Michael, that's... Michael. Michael, Michael, I can recommend you. Go 100% like crazy for this Iranian Renaissance. I, I give you everything from Kashmir to <laughs> Algerian desert or whatsoever. That's yours. Okay. <laughs> it's open. Okay. Okay. All right, okay. then. Uh, so um, th thanks, to everyone. Yeah, um, thanks, everyone, for yeah, coming, for coming in. Yeah, for, for really yeah, being yeah. a great hors d'oeuvre, Edith, and we're all yes. fully stimulated. So bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Yes,